Good morning. This is the record Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel. And I think all we're working off right now, uh, your bill is introduced. You should have a one paper on topics for discussion. I put some of the judiciary issues and then also some issues that were raised in here, but that government operations has been working on this week and is going to finalize a proposal this afternoon and then make recommendations to you on. Not that you can't obviously talk about those, but I just want to let you know that they haven't gotten lost somewhere. Um, and then you also have uh, some language that says at the top, temporary license for early sales to the public, and that's some draft language I have for you to consider uh, a discussion around whether or not to allow dispensaries to do early sales. Um, so uh, is there a certain order, or you just want to take it, go down the list, or do you want to start talking about something in particular first? I would say, if you can, just for right now, skip over the special event license. I had, um, I realized I had a, handouts in my folder uh, that might be helpful for you guys to look at when, if, in your discussions for special events. I it right now, but I, um, I want to go directly to edibles. Okay. To edibles? Okay. Oh, Senator White. I, I'm having a little crisis. All right. I'll be right back. Speaking of edibles, I'm having a crisis, so maybe we can go to special events and then come back to edibles. Uh, well, uh, Peggy is making a hand, uh, copies of a handout for you. Um, oh, I got a handout. Uh, no, I have another handout. Just I thought that you could look at and see what California does with regard to uh, special event licenses, because there's one place that does does do that. Um, but you can chat while she's making the copies if you want to well, about the. Um, well, I haven't drafted any language for it, but you guys sounded it, you guys sounded interested in the idea, basically. Of so right now, you know, there's no ability. Let's just a little review around the public consumption issue. Is that if somebody wanted to have um, you know, a wedding at a event space or something like that, they would not be able to allow anyone to consume at that event space because it would fall under public accommodations law, which our current definition of public place is extremely broad and it covers um, all public accommodations as well as um, any place where uh, using a, a lighted tobacco product or vaping is, is prohibited, as well as places like sidewalks and streets and things like that. So it's extremely broad. Um, and the idea of a special event license would be that if somebody wants to hold a special event, so I was um, looking at something like, with, uh, like up, up in Montreal, like a jazz fest and things like that, they allow people to, to use cannabis at events like that. I and so if you wanted to allow people to apply for a special license from the board, you could create a system to be I able need, to do that. I would prefer to talk about cafes over special events. I just see them as being an advertising spectacle to promote. I'm, I'm not, I'm personally not thrilled with the idea of special events. I, I see them as kind of a I'm going to take the, this is the original one to keep that. Yep. 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 You can get That's that. That's my feeling. And so I need to be convinced that they're not going to be just a, you know, if, if it's a wedding, that'd be one thing. If it's a, you know, a, something that somebody arranges just to have everybody get stoned. I'm not sure I want to, I want, I'm not sure I want to allow that. Well, uh, if I can chime in, I, sure can. I was thinking, um, I know that cafes, which I had thought would be the, you know, the systematic solution to how do we allow people a legal place. I understand in this bill, the idea was to avoid certain flashpoint areas, um, that being one of them, um, because it involves you in, in some ways a little more deeply in the roadside testing and how do people drive there and then drive away. Um, but when I think about um, my experience on economic development, when we were asked to create master permits for resorts um, so that they could have trained personnel and then they could, um, without having to constantly be applying for a special event license, 
they could have the ability to have events where they were serving alcohol outside or, or on, the, on the grounds other right. than in their bar. So it seemed like it, it struck a middle ground where it's affiliated with an institution, <clears throat> which is a hotel or a resort, and they're um, allowed to have their guests on premises in a special place doing it. I wasn't thinking so much of allowing <coughs> the general public to just apply for a license so that they could have, um, you know, the barn down the road suddenly for a day be a place where they smoking, smoking cannabis. So I was thinking a more limited special event license that would be sort of like the master permit in, uh, I think, Title Seven. Okay, I'm not as familiar, I'm not that familiar with okay. the liquor ones, that I, but I can certainly look at that. Um, and would that be... And it requires, you know, that the people... So they would, this would be like an annual permit that they would have rather than kind of an event permit? Because this, this was, I think, the idea was similar to something with, yeah. li with liquor, was that kind of if somebody's out holding a party and they're going to have a bartender being served, and sometimes they get these kind of, yeah. I don't know what they call them, but certain types of licenses from the, from the Liquor Control and, Board to be And able with to alcohol, serve. We've, we've, we've built it out because, you know, frankly, we're, we're trying to grow our craft brew industry and other things, our home distillery industry. So, um, you know, we built it out so that there's a whole sequence of things you can get for if you aren't a bar. Mm -hmm. And you have to have training and you have to have um, other things required. I wasn't thinking of going that broad brush here, but I was thinking if we, if we threw to the board that they would create something paralleling the master permit for... Is that what it's called, master permit? That's what I think of it as. I forget what it's called. But it was, we did it about three or four years ago at the, at the request of places like Stowe Resort and, um, you know, and is, it, is it an annual so that they, so I essentially it would so. be an exemption for, for this. So, it's, so, so like if, you know, if the Stowe Resort wanted to apply for it, it would be an annual license and it would be essentially an exemption from the, the right. public place right. non consumption. And, and it was built around the idea that they had extensive grounds that they controlled. So they were, so it wasn't like the public would be interacting with this. It would be only people who were staying at their at their place or having an event at their place. So it, it was an event license that was on the property of a, a resort or a hotel. <coughs> um, and so we allowed them things we wouldn't allow other special event holders because <coughs> anyway, that that was more of my thought than than I'm having a party this weekend and I, I'd like to, you know there's a farmer who has a barn down the road and I'd like to be able, be able to have a party there and have people smoke that's not at this point where I think we should be doing it, but well, you could do that anyway couldn't you well I, I don't because it's not a public if it's not a it's not, it's not, it's not a public, public. If it's a private it's a, just a private thing home, but, but I mean if you're but renting if, yeah if you're renting if you're if you're if it's a place where you're renting it and it falls under the definition of place of public accommodation where it's offering services to the public, yeah, I mean, if then, it's it your would, friends then it would be yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I had used the example if somebody was having a wedding and rented a space, you know, like the round barn or something like that, and wanted to apply for like a one day event permit was the concept, but they're, you know, they're talking about something different. Would it, would it make sense to ask the board, the cannabis board, to look at rules that might establish ways for people to look legally smoke and legally use. I guess you can eat anywhere. Who's going to know you're eating? Although that is technically prohibited. Well, I would not. You know. But nobody's going to grab a brownie <coughs> away and go test it to see if it's really. So uh, um, can I? That, um, can I just okay, yeah, finish yeah. thought? So if you ask the board to develop rules mm -hmm. that. Um, would allow public uh, consumption either at private um, uh, events um, and, you, and looking at 
other states' best practices. So when you say develop rules, so then you'd be authorizing them to do that type of permit, or do you want them more to kind of look at the issue and I'm come back to, come to you? Back to the legislature yeah. recommendations for okay. how to okay. conduct private events in a safe manner. Yeah. You, you know, looking at other states, <coughs> and other issues and, you can know, finesse the language, but right. the idea, and unless the committee is opposed to that idea of having them. I, I think that it's a good idea to have them look at that and I can tell you I don't think they even need to look at other states. Roger Marcoux was in here the other day and he was talking about the events that were held up there, Sheriff Marcoux, and he, he said they went off without a hitch and he supports, I mean he doesn't support legalization at all, but he does support if we're going to do it, this kind of special event. No, no, I'm just well, saying he yeah, supports. Yeah, but it. when you look at other states, you're also looking at failures. Right, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You could say locally and yeah. in other states. <clears throat> I kind of would like to give them more, more direction than, you know, I think they're going to be deciding mm -hmm. a tremendous number of things. They're, they're coming back with recommendations to us yeah. that we get to decide whether or not to allow them. And what rules would we put in place if we were to allow them? But we're not listing that as one of the licenses now. We're saying look into right. the possibility right. of this as a license. Yeah, this would be yeah. 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 Is that acceptable to everybody? Yep. Yeah. So, kind of related to that, did you want to go down and talk about cafes? Somewhat related. What did you decide about edibles? I'm sorry, I didn't skip. We, uh, oh, we skipped, skipped it because you weren't here. Oh. And we know you had strong position. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll just throw it out there. I, I became convinced during the testimony that it would be foolish to not allow them because at least we'd have a regulated, pack, well packaged, well identified product rather than an unregulated, unidentifiable product that's been cooked with who knows what. Do we in here prohibit them? I don't think we expressed it. So, I don't know. No, they're permitted. In here, mm -hmm. in the but, but the oh, issue, okay. so, I'm going back to the commission. The commission was divided on whether or not it was, <coughs> it was a big controversy. So I, I, Michelle and I flagged it as an issue because it was such a controversy amongst the commission. Well, five of us supported or four of us supported. I think that was one of the motion because it was. My memory was that, and, and I wasn't on the committee then, so I was getting second hand from Joe and other people, Joe and Tim. Was it the testimony from Colorado that that was their recommendation that we not yeah. do that? Well, I think the reason then was because they hadn't had time to develop packaging and other requirements around edibles, and a lot of people were using edibles, and then, as I understand it, you know, not having any impact They'd eat another portion of the edible, and then another, and then all of a sudden it would hit them so heavy that they, they frequently ended up in the emergency. That was the spike, as I recall, mm -hmm. in the emergency room mm -hmm. data that was primarily based on. Mm -hmm. Flip side to that now is that the tax department's estimates on what kind of revenue we're going to see presumes that edibles will be in the package. I don't have a problem putting it in. I'm just saying it, it was such a it was a controversial issue. It should have covered. I think out of everything, it's the thing most likely to come back to, to bite us. <coughs> well, I think that um, it's very clear here that if even if there are animals there, it has to be really well packaged, well labeled, quality control, everything else. So and that I think was one of the big issues in the other states because they didn't they didn't have this deliberative process before they 
who rolled it out. So. Those public, can, public place ta uh, cafes and the special event, are they all <laughs> similar? What, what's the difference between public place and cafe? Uh, just the, the issue had been raised by, I think, a few witnesses, and, and you said just to, to tag it around whether or not to, to take another look at the definition of public place and where people can consume. So I, I don't have a, there's nothing in particular there. Um, okay. yeah, I don't. Where, where is that? Uh, it's an existing law, but it's now uh, reproduced if you look at. Uh, <clears throat> page four. That's the oh. and so uh, um, so it's an existing law which you did when you did legalization. There's the provision in there that says that no person shall consume yeah. mar uh, marijuana in a public place. There's a it's a civil violation, typical <coughs> offense. So you can use a, a civil penalty for that. That is not changed, but it's also kind of brought into this other new cannabis chapter and kind of put up front there with the definition with something very clear there again saying that you can't consume in a public place. Um, I, I think this definition is fine. I don't know if you wanted to put, we well, wouldn't put it in now, but especially if we're going to allow something like special event. Yeah, you'd um, have to exempt it. You'd, you'd, have, you'd have to exempt it. That would be specifically yeah, authorized I'm fine. by law. Pardon? It says unless specifically authorized by law. So right. So if that you were would to yeah. create yep. a public yep. event, then it would be yep. Yep. that law would cover. Yep. Yep. But right now there is none mm -hmm. authorized by law. Okay. Right. Does that take care of public place for now? That's for me. There was a question about it. The Attorney General, <coughs> somebody raised questions about it. We were kind of scratching our heads. That was the health department in their draft the report department. on the right. commission said that um, that the smoke the Vermont smoke free laws didn't apply to cannabis, which just is not true. So I don't know how to I don't know how to deal with that. But. Well, maybe they should have called you for advice. Their lawyer should have called you. Where do you see unless authorized by law? If you look, Alice, on, I'm still on page four. If you look on section 833. 833, oh, okay. Assumption of cannabis yeah. in public place. Can I go back to Adam? One? Sure. So I'm looking on page 22 and so there's a prohibition on products or packaging that make the product more appealing to children. And I, I understand the, the idea is to have a, a brown wrapper or something that's opaque, um, that's not attractive in that way. But I'm, I'm guessing that the idea will be to make it taste good, right? So people, people are inevitably going to mix it with chocolate, let's say. You're going, to have, you're going to open your package, and then you're going to have a chocolate candy bar. And once the package is open, that's, I think, when the problem occurs. Somebody opens at a party, they eat their recommended dose of one piece. Now it's opened, people are at a party, there's a candy bar, somebody eats it, and that's when we have the spikes that Joe was talking about. So I, I think the packaging prohibition is good, but I do think it's it's very possible to imagine people who do not want to consume accidentally consuming, whereas with a smokable or vaped product, you cannot accidentally do that. So that's where my... It's actually a good, I'm thinking back to my visit to the dispensary in Bennington, and they had chocolate cookies. Mm. They didn't offer me any, but um, they had chocolate cookies for patients. Uh, you, you, perhaps you could put one dose per package or something of that nature rather than a package with 12 doses. That would help. I don't know if that's part, if that's advised, you know. You do I'm willing to hear from anybody in the audience on some of these ideas. 
know if you know I'll just about know. Other things, but it looked to me like you know, I would imagine a cookie was one dose of whatever the product was. Um, you do have just, I'll, I'll just draw your attention to the language on page 21 on the rules in subdivision 3B is one of the things they're going to develop rules are limitations to a specific number of servings for each individual package of edible cannabis products. Um, so I they need... just changing that to allowing each package to be only one edible, I mean, like the cookie or the brownie or whatever. You have one brownie, you have one cookie. Well, okay. I mean... Well, if it's this big and it's one serving. You're going to have to eat an awful lot of cookie to get your high. David Mickelberg. David Mickelberg. I almost called you Senator Mickelberg. <laughs> David Mickelberg on behalf of the Marijuana Policy Project. Um, so in the states which had had problems, with, 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 they were not really problems, they were highlighted incidents where certain uh, people were consuming uh, without the proper education. Uh, those states have subsequently gone back and done a lot of what you've incorporated here. And I think we heard from Andrew Friedman, I believe, that said there hasn't been issues um, since they've gone back and done the consumer protection. The thing I just want to remind you is that um, when, you're, when you're buying an edible product or a consumable product um, from from a, a legal dispensary, um, it comes with information. It comes with information on dosing. It comes from, it with information on safe storage. Oftentimes, it comes in packaging that can be reseal, resealable and childproof. You can keep it in that, you know. Um, so I think, in terms of sort of avoiding the harms associated with. Uh, with somebody consuming inadvertently, mm -hmm. actually including it far, serves a much greater sort of consumer protection purpose than just allowing edible, because edibles will exist whether they're in this bill or not. People will be making them, they will be selling I think we agree on yeah. that. The, the question is, should we do single, single, uh, serve, yeah. single serve packaging or should we allow multi-serve packages in one, uh, multi-serve doses in one package? Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard on certain edible products. So, for instance, you know, you, you were thinking in the sort of cookie brownie as a single serving, but oftentimes edibles come in in mints or, or different um, different types of lozenges. lozenges, things like that. So, single serve, it would be hard just from a practical perspective to do like single serve well, of that. But could you, could you look back at that? You know, make sure it's as tight as possible in terms of, of the packaging so yeah. that people are aware of the date of what each dose is. Yes, I think, so what they did in, so for instance, in, um, in Las Vegas, uh, they limited each single serving within a package to no more than 10 milligrams per serving. Um, you could do something like that, either 5 or 10 milligrams per serving, but there could be 10 servings within that. But within each that individually uh, yeah, like a, like a blister. So yeah, and them. actually, in many states, they actually, and I think it's in your bill, you have this, like, you'll see on a serving, it says THC on it, or it'll have a mm -hmm. symbol to, to, to tell you that this contains THC mm -hmm. very clearly, both on the packaging, but also on the individual thing that you're consuming, it will say THC on it as a, as a warning sign. Yeah. So, if you are clear, I think you know the direction we're headed, and then you can provide us with Michelle on the language. But sure. I mean, I, I'm thinking honestly, and, and they call them fun sizes. I last yeah. Sunday at the grocery store, I bought a package of the fun size of Snickers. And, right. You know, and, and, and each one is individually packaged. Right. But just you know, 40 or so fun size. Right. Well, so, so for instance, I don't know. I wouldn't call them fun size. But. So, for instance, if you have a limitation on 100 milligrams per any any type of of edible or consumable product, no matter how many, there could be 10 of them, or there could be 20 of them, five milligrams each, but you can't have more than 100 milligrams in any pack. I'm just picking that. That's what Las Vegas. I mean, okay, that's well, what the body. That would be helpful to help sure. with that. Okay, <clears throat> happy to do it. Yeah. Just, I wonder if Philip raised the question about chocolate and looking at line six on page 22. Do you understand why we would want to prohibit packaging 
that makes the product more appealing to children, but how do you wrestle with the concept of a product mm -hmm. that's appealing to children? It's chocolate, it's appealing to anybody. Are we going to prohibit chocolate because kids might like it? No. I'm a little nervous about that language and how it's set up to be pretty wide open. I, I, th I don't think it's just chocolate here. I th you're talking about lozenges, you're talking about mints, you're talking about brownies or cookies or any one of those things could be appealing to children. Um, I mean, kids If on eat the table those. by itself, but this provision I think is designed to prevent packaging. Right. Right. Appealing. Right. Well, what I'm saying though is that any of the products inside of the packaging could be appealing to children. So if you have, if I have a package of M&Ms and I open it up and eat five of them and then leave it laying around, I mean, that's, I, I don't know how, I think that we have to, I, I do understand, but I think that we have to have some faith that um, people will be somewhat responsible. They're already, people are already using edibles and they're responsible for the most part with them. And the fact that Maureen Dowd let her stupid dog eat brownies. Oh, she herself she, ate or She herself yeah. ate the brownie. Okay, I thought it was her dog, but, but <laughs> she herself ate those brownies. I mean, you can't. Yeah, a nice eat, dog. You cannot, and you cannot legislate stupidity for stupidity. Well, so I, I'm, I'm just concerned that if we go so that we should allow the board. Should be the headline tomorrow's Burlington. Wayne <laughs> said you can't legislate stupidity. We, but I, I think that we're we're putting some faith in this board to to promulgate rules around to to make it as as um, unattractive to children as possible. And I think that we can go into the we. We can go into the details so much here that we get ourselves all wrapped up in a knot, but we should leave a lot of that detail to the board. Uh, That's I'm, my feeling. I, I will say this. Right. Uh, if I go to line, 20, line 3 of page 21, product away from children, mm -hmm. and I think it should be minors. Um, because you're oh, also yeah. talking about those eight, you know, we could argue about the children. Yeah, you're right. I'm still questioning whether we want to leave the word products. Well, can I talk about that for a minute, Jeff? Because I think. Which one? So if you look on page, page 22, 22, there's a prohibition. What are we talking about? Still edible. Still edible. Page oh, okay. 22, prohibition on. So and you agree with my proposal. Thank you. Oh, I already got that. Already, oh, I got that. I wrote that down. <laughs> well, that would need to be changed. Everywhere it says children yeah. needs to be changed to minors. Here it is again on page 22. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, is that the, there's a prohibition on products, you're right, it's not just packaging, products are, or packaging that make the product more appealing to children. And so remember, and this, so this isn't, this is going to be something that's going to be fleshed out by the board through the rulemaking process. So I would say that maybe that through the looking at that, they may say, well, we're not going to ban chocolate, but we're going to put, we're going to say, if you're doing chocolate, it has to be done in this particular way, has to be done in these particular servings, each square has to be stamped with, you know, contains THC or something like that, you know, but maybe they may say a product that is more appealing to children is something like gummy worms, and maybe right. they're going to say we're not going to allow gummy worms, mm -hmm. you know, which is something right. that you see a lot on the West Coast, but the board may say that, that we consider that to be a product that is more appealing to children. Chocolate is something that's appealing to everybody, um, and they, but then you say, well, there's a way to do that. You know, you can, can have no more than four servings per package, you know. Would the word design be better instead of products? Well, you're getting away from the actual content of the word product. Well, because you want to talk, you're talking about the, the you're talking about product. something that is visually appealing to children. Chocolate is going to be appealing one way or the other. That's the product itself. But I, I think to Michelle's point, it's it's getting at uh, a manufacturer who might say, um, we'd like to expand our market, um, not explicitly, but, but you know, outside scrutiny, we'd like to expand our market into minors, and they like gummy worms. 
market surveys show that's their favorite candy. So we're going to put out gummy worms. So that would be a deliberate design to do it, but I, I think more likely you just have people that would be looking for cool, fun, party-like, candy-like ideas, and inevitably you're going to go into a different... Um, can, can we then say product design or packaging? I mean, product is chocolate. Well, it is appealing by itself. And that's and that's my point. If if but there's the word more, <laughs> you know, more prohibition more. on but products more, that yeah. make you know or pack or package. Well, I guess the the more appealing is is modifying. I, I suggest that, that um, think about this for a minute. But I wonder how do we ban? And it, you know, I just instead of gummy worms, how do you ban the making the product? in the form of a Star Wars character or some other thing that might become appealing to kids. That's what you're really looking at. So, um, Joe may That's be correct. I'm not sure. So you're I, saying, Joe, you know, products we designed to make We have the lawyer and the professor work. here on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out um, products or packaging designed to make the product more appealing to children. Yes. It makes okay. sense to them. So, uh, right. so I would do you have a comment? I don't know who I you are, a, so could you identify yourself for the record? I'm just a Vermont citizen. I live in no, that's not good. I don't, well, I don't care. Carol Daigle, I think you mean. Pardon me? Carol Daigle. Oh, oh, thank you. And I drove down from Colchester this morning. Um, it, just a few things. You cannot find anything on the legislative website about marijuana if you look for it. I look several days for the bill that's involved in this, and you can't find it on the website. The sergeant at arms couldn't find it. The sergeant at arms couldn't find it for me yesterday when I was here, and they sent me down to the select legislative committee. Or, or, it, yes. it's under cannabis, not It was under cannabis. Well, that's what we call it. That's what it I, I understand that, but as an independent person trying to find information, there was no cross reference. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. to marijuana at, at the legislative website. So I missed earlier hearings and just happened to hear about this one by pure luck yesterday when I was down here for another reason. But um, um, two things that I would just like to comment on. Uh, well, one, one issue in particular, but the other is a question. I'm, I'm not in favor of legalizing marijuana. Well, we already legalized. Pardon? We've already legalized it. We did that last year. I thought the governor didn't sign the bill. No, no he, did. he did. I understood he wasn't going to sign the bill because there wasn't something about being able to test drivers. This is what we're doing now is is a, another yeah. step where we would test. I think, I think somehow the public and you have been misinformed. We legalized it last year. Uh, the governor signed the bill. Marijuana is legal in Vermont. There's just no way to buy it. Legally. Okay. Then that goes to my question and, and the, one of the points I would like to make. I heard you discussing earlier about being allowed to spend public places. And um, my husband and I go to the fireworks in Burlington. And for us, they were spoiled because they had, there were people around us smoking. They were doing it illegally. They were. But how are the police going to police a, a crowd like that? Well, they give them a ticket. It's not going to happen. Well, I, you know, this going to happen. There's 80,000 according to the Rand report. 80,000 people in Vermont on a regular basis smoke marijuana. The police can give them a civil ticket for smoking in a public place. There's statute already in place that you can't do that. Um, if the police chose not to, that's you know something that they chose not to do. Well, I'm sorry, your fireworks. There are thousands and thousands. Okay. You Thank you. Yeah, right now, I, right the question now. I have is in this discussion of packaging, yep. are these items going to be sold in a specific store that's yeah. just strictly marijuana, or are they going to be at mom and pop stores? They'll be in a place that's specifically licensed to sell marijuana. And would people be restricted by age yes. to go in the store? Yes. You have to be over 21 or 21 or older. Thank you for educating me. You're welcome. Sorry you didn't find it. I'm sorry the sergeant at arms yeah. didn't know the difference between marijuana and cannabis. That that was an oversight. We could have 
cross-reference somehow. Yeah. But yeah. So just so everybody knows, is if on our legislative website, if you go to where you look for bills, all you have to do is put in a keyword, and if you put in a keyword, marijuana, even though the bill is called cannabis, the uh, relating to act relating to regulation of cannabis, because the word marijuana appears numerous times in the bill, the bill should pop up. Maybe we should so, send out a notice to the Sergeant at Arms about how to use the website. Yeah, I feel actually Michelle it doesn't, because I, did do the search with her actually yesterday. Okay, can, can, we, yeah, can we hold this to a yeah. different yeah. conversation yeah. about how we better inform the public about sure. bills? I'm sure if you wanted to look up bank robbery, it might be difficult. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so I have, looking at page 22, subdivision F, little i, so looking at saying products or packaging designed to make the product more appealing to children. How about that? So the design to is referring back to products or the packaging, yeah. which is, I think you want to make sure is what you want, is yeah. because it's not just the packaging that's focused yeah. on that, but it could be products that are specifically designed for that. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys want to just take a quick look at what you have, have there? And, um, and I will speak with David about there, but just going through on page 21 on subdivision 3 on the rules concerning product manufacturers. Remember, you have all kinds of rules that they have to develop for all of the cannabis establishments, but these are specific to the product manufacturers. So it's identification of the amount of THC and CBD that constitutes a single serving. Uh, limitations to a specific number of servings for each individual package. Requirements for opaque child resistant packaging. Requirements for labeling products that include the length of time it typically takes for products to take effect, and appropriate warnings concerning the potential risk of consuming cannabis and the need to keep the product away from minors. Uh, requirements the cannabis product is clearly, clearly identifiable with a standard symbol <coughs> indicating that it contains cannabis, and then the prohibition on products or packaging designed to make the product more appealing to minors inclusion of nicotine or alcoholic beverages in a product and the production and sale of products that are not reasonably detectable to consumers including tasteless powders. Michelle, can I ask if you've defined minors in this bill anywhere? We don't define minors. Um, if you, when you're talking about minors, uh, you know, if you are talking, I mean, when I hear the word minor, I'm thinking that it's under 18. If you want it to be under 21, then I would, I would put that in there define that over here. I think it's important because mm -hmm. we're trying to steer away from anybody under 21. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder, I'm always a little uncomfortable about using the term minor to mean mm -hmm. people under 21 because it's not really, mm -hmm. you know, the, so um, mm -hmm. let me think about whether or not instead of here I can say under 21 without yes. making it too wordy um, because that's always my preference uh, yeah, just to be clear about that is yeah. because mine yeah. typically does meet under 18. So I have a question about page 22 line 10. Mm -hmm. Prohibition on the production and sale of cannabis products that are not reasonably detectable including tasteless powders. I, I see what that's trying to do mm -hmm. but Again, I think the, the, the other than the, the odor when you smoke it, I think it, the design is going to be to make them not be detectable because nobody wants to eat an edible that tastes like the medicine. You want to eat it and have it taste like chocolate. Right. That's a good point. I think I took this from uh, some recommendations of best practices, I think, from actually David's client. So maybe he might be able to explain why they thought that was a good I idea. I mean, the tasteless powder is what I think the goal is in terms of creating the mint that you talked about. You don't want to have it taste like anything other than mint. So if it seems like here we would be insisting that these things taste it's a, like. I thought of it. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think the, the one of the concerns is just the application of it without knowing what it is. But I can get more information on that. Um, it's it was to avoid um, having something that's not obviously. Um, but I think then we're back to the problem with edibles. Edibles generally. Well, with a tasteless powder, you can't you can't stamp it with a, a thing that says THC with it, you know, yeah. or you can't. 
identified. It's, just, it's a much more, I think, slippery slope to have something which is a odorless, tasteless powder. That okay, so the, the reasonably detectable is including the, the stamp or the, mm -hmm. on the actual product itself. Yeah. Yes, the, if you see, if you, if you, if you, if you purchase at a legal state uh, uh, an edible product, you'll see many of them will right on the individual mint or yeah. gummy have a symbol or some signifying um, thing that, that indicates that this is THC. Some will have actual dosage on it, so it'll say five milligrams or you know whatever it is. So I think with the with the powders and things like that, it's harder to. But and if I could just one more, what's the difference between the oil? So we're going to sell oil that's in a bottle. And that bottle is labeled, but we're not going to sell a vial that has the powder. So what's the difference in terms of its ability to be detected outside the bottle or outside the vial? Yeah, um, I don't know, and I could be wrong, I don't know that that oil is so, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Is yeah. the intent, though, to label the carrier? Yeah. We're not trying to prevent production of the tasteless powder, simply trying to make sure that whatever container has well, it, it is properly laid. It is prevented. I, I see that, right. and that's why I think this yeah. needs to be tweaked a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think we might as well eliminate this sentence because it gets you back to the questions that we've already sort of provisionally answered about edibles anyway. Take it we, it, we were, it was an attempt to be more cautious about yeah. that. Yeah. So I would eliminate the phrase including taste with power because it would make one leave the rest of that in. But then I then I think somebody could say edibles fall into that. No, because they're, they're labeled. If they're sold with a label attached to them, then, then you're okay. Right. Well, then we've got to get rid of oils, which are also. No, because the, la no, the, 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 the vial is labeled. Well, but, okay, so then we are now allowing tasteless powders. If it's in the vial, it's, it's properly labeled. Okay. Yeah, I mean, what I'm pointing to is the contradiction <coughs> in, the, in the bill. So if we eliminate it and we're okay with having tasteless powders sold in a vial and oil sold in a vial, then that makes sense. So just, so just on two, a little too. Little wait, wait. I'm sorry. Are, are you done with that? I didn't. I don't know what you guys decided. I would leave it there and cross off including tasteless powders, okay. so that it does say that they have to be that you can't sell. Prohibited are things that aren't that aren't labeled. That's essentially what we're saying here: is that you can't sell. I would. I, so that I would. Labeled. I would. Listening to this debate, I would. So if you want to take off including tasteless powders, fine. But I would change detectable to identifiable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just, just, I'm just wondering in um, double I, why would you not have other, other drugs or something in there as well? Since it says, you know, you can't put nicotine or alcohol in how about other drugs. You are welcome to do that. Again, it was just looking at some things that had been recommended either by. Uh, different groups or other states around. Um, Are you talking about other legal drugs or other, I mean, it would be clearly impermissible to combine with like cocaine or methamphetamine, it's not illegal, but. Well, how about, uh, you know, some prescription drug? Why mm -hmm. would you think you're excluding I, alcohol and nicotine? I think that was just to go because, um, I mean, that's good. Those are but. two things that are, uh, regularly included? Uh, so well, there are products out there, yes, that, um, aren't drugs. that, that do. Um, and um, well, they're legal products. I think it would be well, harder to, harder to, if you were a product manufacturer, it would be, you'd have to first get a prescription and get the drug, and then you'd have to somehow beat it up or, I mean, alcohol and, um, <coughs> Uh, tobacco are pretty readily available, and 
So you, I don't know how you would put a legal, a legal drug in a cannabis. Break open a capsule and put it in. I, I suppose you could. It's pretty easy. Okay. But it, it seems to me since you specifically mentioned these yeah. two that you'd want to mention drugs, le legal drugs, mm -hmm. as you say, also, if, if you're going to mention these things. <coughs> but. Um. I mean, I don't know where. Other prescription drugs or other drugs. You might put well, coffee in now it. Now I'm thinking and, about the witness yesterday was talking about if you had trouble sleeping, you would recommend the nine pound hammer. So what if you what if you had a company that put some other sleep aid right. in with it? No dose. No, no that's not the case. No dose. <laughs> <Dose. laughs> <laughs> the reason I saw the brewer somewhere I've been was, uh, mixing cannabis in the beer. In uh, the Netherlands. Somebody. Montreal's going to start selling this continent. The most interesting thing about the testimony yesterday was the heightened incidence of accidents when alcohol and beer, I mean, alcohol yeah. and beer, when alcohol and yeah. marijuana are mixed. Yeah, right. Um, I thought that was excellent testimony. That was good testimony. Mm -hmm. Now, so if you were thinking of uh, an event, and the event served both alcohol and marijuana, but, you know, they should give up their keys. I, I don't know. I don't. But you disagree? No, uh, no, no, no. On this, on this one, I'm trying to figure out with Alice how you um, you might have somebody to put valerian okay. in with it, but that's not a. That is a sleep aid, but it's not a prescription drug, or um, so I, I don't know how how you would. Okay. Can we move on? But but my guess is that the board will go into more detail on There's those. No way they're going to be thinking okay. about all this stuff. Uh, can we move on? Yeah. yeah. We're, we're going to have a whack a mole for so. Few years. Yeah. Oh. We're done with public places and edibles. I think we're done with public places, edibles, and uh, And did you talk about cafes? cafes? Well, we can talk about them, but I think the message that I've got is it's similar to the public place and uh, the special event. Event. Okay. That, you know, I think, and I'll go back to taking things as slowly in this state, in which we've always done, and I think we, I, Hate to be, sound like the governor, but I think maybe we're better off to wait and see how other states like Las Vegas, Las, Las, states like Las Vegas, states like Nevada handle some of these mm -hmm. issues um, and try to learn from them mm -hmm. before we jump into, at least in this bill, cafes. If the yeah. House wants to add it, it would certainly be a good debate. Massachusetts is working on its cafes with cafe rules right now. Well, be, if, you know, I think at that time, again, you know, I'm reminded that we have, this is not the end, this is the beginning, and we have at least a year. When we get the timeline, we can discuss that, but we have a minimum of a year before you could even begin a sale. That would be, so I don't see how you could even do it before July 2020. Mm -hmm. So we have another session to go over some of these issues, and I, I think it's, you know, the whole bill would become about cafes if you add that in. Mm -hmm. And I'm leaving it out. Yep. Um, the question about that I am just completely stumped on is because I'm not, I mean, I grow, I have a small garden, so I understand how to garden, but I'm not a cultivator, and I don't understand cannabis sizes, and that whole issue just I lost it over yesterday. And the guy, from, uh, the guy who talks about his wife carrying on 60 grand after he sold his 20 pounds of product. Um, was he? Was he talking? He, he, was he talking? He grows these plants here. Well, he no. He, he, he was talking right. about growing the seeds to make a better strain of marijuana. And I, as I understood it, uh, if you go by plant count. You'd rather go by plant count than 
plot size. Is that, I, did I, I miss it? I think it was the reverse. He wanted to go by not canopy size, but split footage and have it be But, but canopy, I, I don't get the distinction here because no. the, when we say 500 square feet, is the canopy si the allowed canopy size for the small ones? I mean, we have that in here someplace, 500 square feet. That is the what it says here is that that 500 square feet. Can you feet, direct us to that okay. section? Well, Michelle, so okay. we're talking about. So the, on, uh, the so the board is to be developing tiers for the cultivators. Um, uh, so if you look at page 25, bottom of the page. And so subsection D talks about the types of licenses and directs the board to develop tiers for cultivator licenses based on the plant canopy size of the cultivation operation. Yeah. So that one plant canopy size clearly says what it means is it's the area that you're growing. It doesn't include your office space or your that kind of thing. That's what plant canopy size means. If you look at there is a it's definition. It's on the yeah, definition on page 15. 15. 15. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't get why people work so upset about the plant canopy size because it just says that's your growing area that doesn't include your I don't have a problem I, yeah. just, I just I, I, I don't it. know why well, I, I'm yeah. only going yeah. by and if somebody here wants to yeah maybe she yeah. Laura Subin from Rock Coalition to regulate marijuana I believe that the concern that he was expressing was that to to cultivate clones like he wanted to do takes up more space than right. to cultivate the plants and so if there was some he was advocating for some language in there that would make a distinction or allow for more space for that kind of cultivation operation without making, bringing it to the next tier. I think that was his point. So does I, anyone so have so another pay a higher license fee for growing clones? Another, another permit oh, is what he's talking about. In the cultivation about. licensing, another consideration. I, I also okay. not buy this. So. He wanted 2,000 instead of 14. That's true. Yeah, what he said was that um, 1500 was good, and if you're a good grower, that was great. But if you were a lousy grower, <coughs> that was really what you mean, 2000 If you're a lousy grower, you should probably go out of the business. Well, that's what he said. Give those people, give those people an opportunity by giving them 2000 But thank you. <laughs> so we could, we could direct the board to come up with, um, in where it says that they can do tiers, we could direct them to come up with some kind of tiers around cultivators that um, would specifically address breeders. Yes. I attended a hearing back in December in Williston, and some of the people that spoke were talking about the cultivation. And I have a question about the bill that you're working on. Does this have anything to do with restrictions on the power or the concentration? Because I'm hearing people talking about um, the cultivation yes. and, and creating stronger forms. It, this is a markup. I, I just want to explain. This is a markup of a bill, and um, the question would have been better directed a couple of months ago. But you know, when the House takes up the bill, but can you answer that, Michelle? Briefly. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry, what was the question? The question is, does this particular bill deal with the, the amount of concentration that's going to be allowed as people cultivate and Oh, and yes. Yes, 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 it does, yes. because the different, um, that's the, the amount of acres or square footage. And also, the towns have the ability to say what, what will be in their town if they want to have a vote to not allow cultivation or to allow cultivation. But it also specifies that they that there any if there has to be a label on it that says what the concentration of THC is in but, any but, product. No, I, thought, I think your question is about cultivation. Well, no, right, it was cultivating it's, for a stronger. Okay. Part of that yeah. is right. what yeah. I was the yeah. meeting was people. Yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah. this isn't a. I, I mean, I'm trying to allow the public to to enter into the it's, discussion. This is Mark. It does address that. that. Uh, I'm getting a little concerned. Folks, can we, can we just, look, we've got a job to do, and that's mark up this bill. And, and I, I, you know, I, I, appreciate I appreciate your questions, but, you know, they, unfortunately, Hindsight. You, time is tight, and you didn't um, get on the list to testify about your views and your concerns about the bill, and I'm sorry about that, but um, 
Now, I, I would urge you to put your name in for the House when they take up the bill. And, and you, can talk, you, can, you can talk to each of your representatives and your senators. Well, I emailed my representative. Well, Back. Well, probably getting that's, that's <laughs> typical of representatives. <laughs> 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 it's because we're getting thousands. <laughs> From Colchester? Oh, well, you're saying. doesn't have an email. He doesn't have email, but we'll let him know you were here. <laughs> Thank I will too. So can we move on? Where were we? Uh, yes. So talking about the candidate says, I was wondering whether or not you might be able to ask the person in the room who grows over there uh, if there's a suggestion for language to address the other gentleman's issue around the clones. Okay. Yep. In a way, you might yeah, have yourself. Uh, Shane Lynn, executive director of Champlain Valley Dispensary. I think the gentleman is kind of looking to uh, mentioning yesterday about breeding genetics. He'd like to basically have a nursery. You know, think of a nursery, and he'd like to just sell those plants and, and not be uh, constrained to a flowering canopy. And so he's thinking more of like, hey, a nursery, I want to go in, buy plants, uh, and, and so have more of those. And so I think it would have to be potentially a separate tiered system for, for those people. Uh, so it would be a... You wouldn't be I'm selling any... Of, I'm just trying to think about what to do maybe, around maybe, my language. Maybe not maybe consider a, a small subsection on... Uh, nursery, the nursery license or yeah, something? Okay. Is it okay if I just talk with him about yeah, something and, out there? Yeah, I, I would, you know, I lost, when you, said, when you started answering the question, I lost track of what it was. I'm sorry. It will come back, but um, it's a sign of old days. I know. Um, what I was going to say was, if you could um, work out something that, you know, would be more like we did with hemp. Do you remember when they first grew up, we were looking at scientific, you know, for, Test, test, plot, test plots mm -hmm. where you would have a specific rule regarding testing, that sort of thing. That's more what he was doing. He was testing product to see if the strain was good or bad or whatever. It's a different process, I think. Yep. It was just a suggestion, Michelle, but line 13, instead of cultivator license, you recognize your cultivator licenses, such as breeders or flowering licenses. Yeah. Um, but we're actually ceding to the board the authority to say what licenses shall be available. Mm -hmm. So my thought is just to have the inclusive statement, <coughs> such right. as or something of that. Okay. Name. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't know whether there would be different kinds of licenses for wholesalers either, or anything else on the list. Well, I think what you have in too mm -hmm. is that they developed the tiers for the cultivators mm -hmm. and may develop tiers for others. Right. And so if you look at like some place like Mass, you know, they've got like maybe 10 to 12 tiers for cultivators and you could have different ones in there and you could, if you add something in here, you could have a, a tier for nursery, you know, for nurseries that are of a certain size, and you could have for others that are based on can size or something like that. But I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Shane a little bit to try to understand the, the issue a little better and then see what we come up with. Okay, we're done with canopy. Mm -hmm. Canopy is so far bad, isn't it? <laughs> Some are. <laughs> Open for us well. It would be a bed in this instance too, but it's oh. kind of bed you're thinking of. Can we um, <coughs> jump to criminal history records? Yeah. What um, page is that? There was a lot of discussion about that. What page is that on? Um, and we did have recommendation from David Silverman and others on this issue. Um, one of my concerns is that we not obviously have to do with huh? 24, 24. page 24. Um, one of my concerns is that when we include minority groups, we not forget that one of the minority groups in Vermont is the Abenaki Nation. Vermont recognizes the federal government still hasn't. Um, and so I, 
and I don't know, but as as we can, you know, look at minorities, I don't think we should forget that that was a minority that was certainly um, discriminated against by the state of Vermont and the federal government. So, do you want to talk about the priorities or or, or well, about both. whether or not but that I just want to, right. it, because it comes in there with the criminal disproportionately at Abenaki. And that community is yeah, that, that actually would be, I'm sorry, on page 27. I thought you were talking about app, uh, applicants' criminal history records. Which is well, it's both. But okay. it's both because the criminal history record would have to do with the view that many who were um, arrested during the war on drugs had to do with minority groups or particularly young people. And if you look at the Nixon tapes, listen to the Nixon tapes when there was a discussion of back in, you gave us this history, Michelle, back three years ago, where the, it was caught on tape. Nixon talking about making sure to not lower the schedule on marijuana because he wanted to go after the hippies. Even though his commission that he had appointed, the special commission, had recommended not having a marijuana rank at that level. So you can, you can look at that. So. Yep. Then, sure. then, so then when you get to criminal records, what I don't want to do is give a preference to somebody with a criminal record over somebody who got their record expunged. Or never had. Or never had. Mr. Chair, um, one of the people who had testified earlier on that question, um, we spoke yesterday, uh, and she indicated that she hadn't been uh, arguing for a preference, but rather a, a level playing field, if I yeah. understand. So yeah. I think um, yeah. it may have been a misunderstanding about where that right. line would fall. Well, I'm looking at Laura's test. Laura's, uh, she submitted a social equity sample language document, I think. I'm looking at well, that now. I, I don't, we, on page 28, we already, I mean, we do, it is there on page 28, line 5, 6, and 7, right? Well, I think that they would, they had some proposals. We asked them for proposals. Do we have those? Hmm? Yeah, I, I thought, what, Peggy, what? You, you know the letter that you, you got this, said we'll, I will post and make copies. Mm -hmm. This was this morning. Yep. Can, can you print that out for yep. everybody? Right here. Sorry about that. I thought everybody had it because no. you said I'll post for you. Thank you. I just confirmed in the files. I didn't know it was going to look today. So I just want to. And it is posted. There's, um, there's the issue around working in the priorities and then your discussion around inclusion of communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the drug war. <coughs> There's that issue. Then also what I have down here is criminal history records, which is well, on when they're doing background checks, which is a separate issue. Yeah, I just make clear that the expungement issue is going to be in the House bill overall looking at expungement rather than doing expungement here and expungement in other places. But the House wanted to take the lead on that. So I'm, even though we took testimony on the bill that would have um, deleted the fee of the fee to the court if the person um, had their record expunged, um, you know, the, the fee of the state's attorney filed the petition rather than the individual. We'll let the House deal with all of that, and then we can add stuff to it, obviously, if we, if we need to. Peggy, can I have one? Please? Oh, sure. Well, you didn't get it. <laughs> For Michelle, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> I took Peggy by surprise. I guess you didn't expect me to take this up. Yeah, no, I thought it was just going to go in the folder. There's also the one that Silverman sent around the language of the records. Right. Mind, going to that. But I don't know. I think Did you have that one, Peggy? Uh, the no. letter from David. Well, that was, email from David Silverman. Wasn't that the last? No, yesterday? it's a different. It's different. It was yesterday, but I don't know that, that we didn't look at it yesterday. Yeah, it should be in your gave it to us yesterday. Yeah, yeah yesterday I gave it to you guys. No, um. So 
So I thought the bottom tech sets already existed, that you can only invest in one. Well, no, they're saying unless the additional license is going to be equity candidates. So, what, what? so it's a, in effect, it's a, it's a... So we're going to allow so some people to invest in more than one, but not other people. No. Why That's, would we do that? That is the proposal. Why would we do that? I, I think if the, if the main goal is to increase the diversity of the, the holders of the licenses, then that would be why we do that. So, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I buy that at all. I I, I wouldn't support it because I, I like the idea that we're starting everybody evenly. And this seems to cut against the idea that we would want to keep uh, everybody to one license. Right. You could wind up with one person aligned with 10 or 15 other people who qualify as equity candidates, and then in essence have to run right. one company. I just sent right. you the same language. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have that deal for you. Peggy, you can take mine, hard copy. I, and I do some of the things at the beginning, like the, the outreach and the conducting necessary and the, and the disparity study. I, well, I think those are probably good. It's going to delay it for another year. Um, if we want to. What are you looking at? I'm just, yes. This came out. I mean, if we're going to do a study on how to. It, I can't. I can't. Can I, can I make a, uh, uh, a pitch, Mr. Chair? Mm -hmm. I like, um, under rules concerning any campus establishment made, I like the first mm -hmm. XX, mm -hmm. and in, I would get rid of the colon. Well, okay, keep the colon, and then do um, uh, lowercase i, conducting necessary and appropriate outreach to diverse groups that may qualify, and then uh, Roman numeral six, creating a program promoting a program for technical assistance for equity applicants. If we did those two things, I think that's quite enough um, extra additional work for that board to be doing. Um, but the others I would, I would not pick up on. I, I, creating the program for technical assistance, I think that we could, um, there's a section in here that talks about working with other boards with expertise or other departments with expertise. Um, include, we're going to add very specifically, or we're going to suggest adding very specifically that working with ag, for example, around um, testing and quality control. So I, I would say here we could add something that working with DOL and ACCD, but I don't think the board itself should have responsibility for doing that. I think that they can <coughs> work with labor and ACCD that both have training programs to try to um, implement that. That would be my suggestion instead yeah. of so asking the board to do it. Where were you on little I, I, I? Look, little BI. Phil was dropping. I think it was so on the proposal was just the one right here. Just to do six. Six. Number six. But no, yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I was looking for I. one and six, yeah. and then the language up top on XX. And so in other words, put this in, but I XX. take Jeanette's point. I think that's maybe a better way to do that one. So in that case, I would change my suggestion to the XX language followed by the I language, and then a period after under this chapter. And then elsewhere, maybe we um, suggest that program align with those agencies. Laura? Um, Laura Sutton from the Coalition to Regulate Marijuana. Uh, I am also, to Senator White's point, I have collaborated with Silverman, Dave Silverman, on some language that is more specific about the things that you're saying. We just didn't have time to pull it together, but we should have it for you by this afternoon, where I think you're also might be talking about those types of issues. Um, and we we are absolutely fine with what Senator Baruth is suggesting right now. I did want to clarify that the suggestion in in this of this language in this around a study was not another let's study this issue. It was in order to um, 
protect the constitutionality of prioritizing certain, the possibility of prioritizing certain communities to have that area have some information and data to support that the, the, that these were communities harmed by the war on drugs. So I, I'm not attached to it, but I just wanted you to understand that that was the recommendation and not a let's study this issue about whether the war on drugs has had a disparate mm -hmm. impact on those communities. Can I ask a question, Dick? I just want, want to ask a question of Laura. Laura, when you keep saying communities, are you, define for me communities. Are you talking about a group of people that have been disproportionately impacted? Or when you are using communities, are you talking about sometimes communities where someone would have preference to have a place located? I, I think both. <laughs> I think that there are, um, we know that the war on drugs disproportionately impacted poor people of color and that poor people of color might you can demonstrate that there are concentrations of poor people of color in certain communities so i believe that both those individuals and those communities should get some kind of preference for access or benefits from a tax rate of the lobby in well, no they that won't they'll all be in chittenden county we have we have a very very small minority community so they'll either all be in chittenden county or the ones in Wyndham County will all be owned by women because, well, I mean, although if you include the economic yeah. impacts and the economic justice impacts so that if you include people that disproportionately impacted, people who can't pay their fees, people right. who can't get out of the cycle of criminality around low-level marijuana convictions because of factors like poverty, it would be much more inclusive of issues beyond just race. Yeah. Are we good with those suggestions? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Well, can we work from there? And I, I kind of I, I, thought. With regard to Phil's suggestion, I'm wondering a limited in the number of marijuana establishments, a major investor. I don't think they're talking about that one. No, the, actually, what Jeanette and I said we didn't like the bottom line. No. Oh, okay. I thought you wanted no, to move that just above. The top, no. no, it's just the top around the, procedure. Okay. Oh, no, no, I don't want to move that So drop the bottom line. Yeah. yeah the okay, first good. XX is what I was talking First talking. XX and, and the then one line. and six. Not six. One and what? One. Just XX and one. Oh, that's all you're doing now. Okay. Well, Jeanette had the suggestion of doing six elsewhere with um, leaning on those okay. established agencies. Okay. Okay, I'm good with X, X, and Y. Okay. Okay. What is wrong with is either little III requiring each marijuana staff to report on diversity of its workforce? No. Is there some problem with that? With me? With anybody. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, I don't yeah. know that we... I mean, I, because I if, if, you're, if you have your establishment in um, Grafton, Vermont, the yeah. chances of you having a diverse workforce are going to be nil. I, I mean, but, but, uh, unless, why wouldn't you report that? But why? what difference does it? What what impact is it going to make? I mean, why is what's the purpose of reporting? Yeah, I guess are you going to say no one can have one in a place where there aren't any minority groups? No, no, I mean, no, no, no. So why bother well, reporting? I, I'm just wondering. It's a private business establishment. And granted, it has to be licensed, but. We don't do that elsewhere in, in, the, in the private sector where we require reporting of diversity information. Um, and I Well, I can tell you we ain't very diverse in Bennington either, but right. we've got a lot of the diversity in the program I used to run in terms of both employees and um, yeah. uh, I'm going to call them students, um, residents. I, I, I think it's impressive. I wish more people would do that. This report. I mean, that's part of why Vermont has a reputation that it does because we don't. Nobody knows the facts. So I think Bennington is a very, it's a very small minority population. But I they have 70 employees now, and it is a very diverse employee group. So I would argue with you. I, I don't care. I just what, see no reason see for doing what, it. What we're be accomplishing the ultimate result. You get a report, and it's obvious from the report there are no minorities employed. Is there a ramification for that? 
I don't think so. Just that we would, we would at least know whether there's been or not. The only thing that's got me nervous about this whole thing is you are placing in front of the board a requirement in Phillips' suggestion here, you are conducting necessary and appropriate outreach. Does that come before we start granting licenses? Because you're going to delay the process. So. You're going to delay it by months. Well, but, I, but I, I, I think the point from the social justice equity witnesses that we had was this is an opportunity to start everybody equally, but you don't start equally unless you do some extra work with people who have been disadvantaged, and that includes outreach prior to the licensing process. So I don't, I don't think it's too much to ask. I mean, we do this when we put out um, RFPs, you, uh, or, or when you're hiring, you know, we, we call it enriching the pool, where you have, uh, when we hire at UBM, for instance, we're, we're required to do things to enrich the pool. That is outreach to minority communities that might not otherwise read the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, and as a result, we have a richer pool, the number of minority candidates higher is higher. So when I when I limited it to the first XX and one, I I think that's that's not too much work to ask of the board, but it's it's a necessary bit of work to ask of the board. Is, is there any cost that's associated with that? Probably, yeah. yeah. And who's going to determine what's necessary and appropriate? Well, that's up to them to interpret. The board well, is doing everything. Um, I guess I'm a little nervous. I'm not going to scream bloody murder and object to it, but I'm just a little nervous on how that can delay things and cost us something. <laughs> I don't understand what that cost might well, be. Yeah. So, what? To diminish pleasure, you would rather not have her. Just no. do what Philip suggested in the first place. Which is what? You mean X, X, his proposed X and I. And that's it. You know, I don't know that I like I either. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I don't know because I don't know what it means and I don't know what conducting necessary and appropriate outreach means and I don't know what it means to diverse groups. Does it mean to the poor farmers in that we're going to have a concentrated um, outreach effort to poor farmers in Bell's Vault or in Rockingham? Or does it mean we're going to outreach to women? Does it mean we're going to outreach to new Americans? To, um, it, it isn't, I think it is really, um, well, I, I don't know how you yeah. do that and how they would interpret that. I mean, elsewhere in the bill we have, we have descriptive language that points at communities that have been disproportionately harmed and I think we don't have super specific definitions there, but I think the board would have sufficient. I would ask that Michelle draft in the redraft that we'll look at in the near future, like next week, um, highlight draft and put in XX and I. I think I can tweak the language a little tweak bit. Tweak the language a little because bit. Because I think that if you're talking about the outreach to diverse groups that may qualify, I think it's, it's going back to those who have been disproportionately harmed by marijuana prohibition. And so I think I can tie those things together. And then you can look at, okay. you can just look at right. the language in the, okay. Okay. in your name. Okay, so, all right, so thank you. Let's just do that. Okay. Yeah. And we'll add in our recommendation about that working with other boards. So we'll add uh, now you look at the criminal history of disqualification language, and you'll note that uh, there is the final sentence is not underlined. Uh, prior offenses will not automatically disqualify a candidate. First of all, should we put in based on factors to demonstrate where the applicant presence possesses the threat to public safety and promise this in a regulated environment? So that would be, you know, you look at the criminal history and based on factors, 
in that criminal history whether the person possesses a threat, poses a threat. So the person applies for a job, has a, um, a trafficking in marijuana, 50 pounds or more, and a trafficking in cocaine, and it was all headed down Route 89 to 91, headed to Greenfield, Mass, and Holyoke, and you know, clearly this is something to do with organized crime, so you would disqualify based on that, even though they have a prior record, but the person has a possession 22 years ago, why would you, or you know, say 22 years ago, it wouldn't be automatically disqualified. We would determine whether they presently pose a threat. Right. Yeah. Never mind whether they were expunged or not. Well, if they were expunged, it doesn't exist, well, so you wouldn't know that. Wouldn't know. Um, the so. question is, uh, my question would be, what happens if you add in prior offenses from not automatically disqualify a candidate? Does, does that mean that if you can't prove it was drug trafficking, they're not disqualified? I'm kind of worried about that sentence and all of those. I think if you if you say that, then you know somebody who has a racketeering, you know, commercial fraud, embezzlement, tax evasion, drug trafficking convictions on their record, you still can't. You still have to come up with some basis for why they presently pose a risk to not. And so I think that if by saying that prior offenses and being so broad, prior offenses shall not automatically disqualify. Um, I mean, do you want the board to be able to look at, I mean, and I mean, what you have in there is that they're, they're gonna develop standards for determining whether or not, and so states have done it differently, but yeah, I think. I would think that we would strike the not automatic, not automatic. With a little tweak. So you would say nonviolent offenses shall not disqualify? I don't know why you have any of that language. Well, right now the bill says non nonviolent drug right. offenses. Uh, shall not I'm, I'm asking why we have any of that. Because I think we're saying that they, it shouldn't automatically, just because you have a prior offense, you, it doesn't automatically disqualify you. It, there's some other thing that disqualifies you. The, the board shouldn't just say anybody who has a record is disqualified. Isn't that what this means? Well, but yeah, because a lot would depend on the board. If you had, if you had a very strict board and they just decided. We don't want anybody who's ever been convicted of anything to to have a license. Why? I don't think that's the sense of the committee. All right. Well, I'll go because with. right now, for a dispensary license, you can't have prior uh, drug, drug convictions, and so this is a change in policy saying that nonviolent drug offenses should not automatically disqualify, and then you would read that in concert with the other one saying they have to be present, but this is just kind of a so change to the board, you can't you automatically would, We would not somebody. strike the nonviolent drug. Yeah, we would just say that. Keep the nonviolent drug. Mm -hmm. I would just say prior offenses. I would, I would flip the sentences, frankly. I would start by saying prior Offenses shall not automatically disqualify a candidate. The board shall adopt rules and set forth standards for determining whether an applicant should be denied because of criminal history based on factors that demonstrate whether the applicant presently poses a threat to public safety and the proper function of the regular government. Mm -hmm. I just, my concern there, and I don't know I've you know, it's part of the discussion, but is that if you say prior offenses shall not automatically disqualify a candidate, you have somebody that has been involved in some big operation of financial crimes and tax evasion and things like that, and it's, maybe it's in the past, and maybe they've completed their sentence, but you want to say to the board that they can't say based on that, we're going to consider no, you that you're presently not? If 
Well, that's where the question turns. Are they presently posing a threat? Mm -hmm. If they're no longer posing a threat, why would you want to deny them no matter what their previous crime was? Well, what if they were convicted of a RICO offense and did 20 years? That shows a history of the sort of behavior you most want to avoid, which is... The, the question again would turn on are they therefore presently a threat? Who has to prove that they're not? Yeah. The applicant? Sure. Which, who's, who's it on yeah. to prove they're not? They uh, that's what I get not. nervous about, Joe. Whose responsibility is to, to prove that they're not? The yeah. establishment owner, the, the, li the, the licensee, or the individual? That's where the problem comes in, in my view. So this guy, let's say it was a nonviolent thing, but he's but he's continually embezzled over the last 30 years, and for 10 years he stopped embezzling. Does that, as you say, disqualify. well, it doesn't automatically disqualify him. Well, who, ha you know, who gets in trouble if they don't hire him? Because they're worried about hiring somebody with a long history of embezzlement that's never been expunged. And I'm sitting there, I'm the owner of this establishment, and I'm making a decision now, am I gonna get sued by this guy for not hiring him because he has a history of, but he hasn't done any embezzlement in the last 10 years, so we should, we should give him a chance behind the cash register. Well, with this, this directive is us telling the board to develop rules over the subject. If the um, burden of proof of establishing one way or the other, are they currently a threat or not, is something well, I'm going to turn this on you, the, what you said about my proposal on the reports. Where else do we require an employer to determine whether or not the person is still a, you know, do we, do we say no, to the employer at the uh, at Mazza store that Dick Mazza has to determine whether the person? No, I, I think the entire issue is a legitimate one, but we are giving directive to the board <coughs> to come up with a schematic and the um, direction from us is we're trying to tell them that, first off, the mere existence of a prior criminal record does not automatically disqualify yep. somebody. Secondly, in developing a rule, there should be a determining factor of whether the individual currently poses a threat. Mm -hmm. You might look back in time and see a record of embezzlement and decide that that is a current threat. I don't want to prevent the board from making that conclusion, but I'm not, I don't think we disagree. I think we we have a similar I, purpose. I don't, I don't want it in there. That's my position. I'm sure. what? The whole thing? The whole thing? Or the, the whole thing? No, 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 the last. The second change. Right. If you just went back to the, if you didn't strike nonviolent drug, I'm okay with that. I. I agree, and okay. my reasoning is prior offenses is all inclusive, right? right. And there are there are many things I would think that should murder disqualify. Right. Hate right. to say it, but yeah, yeah. In other words, if Ted Bundy walks in yeah. and says somehow I got out of jail, and I want to start a <laughs> came back from tax the tax yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would be well, I think I came up that would be pretty hard. hard. <laughs> Charles Manson. He was uh, born, he's born in Vermont. Oh, I'll point out. Did he go to Santa Clara? At the one club. Yeah. Uh, you should ask Bob Relations for the history. I went to Anyhow, so are we okay with that compromise? Okay, leaving right. nonviolent drug in. Right. And Not then I will just tweak the, I'll tweak the other language. Right. So if somebody has, um, so the board could say anybody that has anything other than a nonviolent drug conviction is automatically um, eliminated here. Yeah. Yeah, yes, they could. If we, the, if, if we say nonviolent drug offenses shall not autom automatically I disqualify. I don't think they will, but they could. They could. They, they could, could say. You have to read them in concert with one yeah. another, the right. two things and the standards, and I can work on that language okay. to clarify that. I yeah. think the, the intent with what you, the sponsors originally did was just to make it clear by adding that language about the 
the nonviolent drug offenses is that the current state policy is that if you do have drug convictions, you can't participate in the right. industry, and that there is a policy change, and that those those drug offenses should not, but that there may be all sorts of different things that may, uh, and um, but that so well, let me let me play with it a little bit. Just, okay. okay. If I had a 1986 conviction for simple assault, does the board have the power of this to say that automatically disqualifies me from getting a license? I and mean, that's the way I'm reading it. Yeah. That's the way I'm reading I'm not sure that that's where we want to go. I, I understand what you guys want conceptually, so let me just have to take some time and work on some language and see if I can come back to something. Can I make a suggestion? It is now 1025. Well, it's actually 1020. Um, I suggest we break until 20 minutes of 11. Give all of us a chance to stretch. Yeah. Think before we come back to the next questions. Okay. We, we finished with those two things, and so it's on to home delivery. Um, okay. Uh, I, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I got, you know, we got, I started out believing that was the dumbest idea. But I'm, I, I actually think I'm fine without including delivery here. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It took a long time for public safety, I think, to come up with rules around delivery for um, the mm -hmm. dispensaries. And I think that they, they they probably somehow patterned them after pharmacy deliveries, because pharmacies can deliver. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm a little bit less um, convinced that we need it for the adult use market. But Supposing that South Burlington votes to not, not allow it, mm -hmm. um, should the residents of South Burlington have to drive to Winooski mm -hmm. to buy it? Well, Dummerston has no, um, Dummerston, the town of Dummerston has no kind of um, center and they have no um, retail kinds of establishments. So if somebody wants to buy groceries from, that lives in Dummerson, they have to drive to a grocery store or they have to drive to the bookstore to get a book. They don't, um, so I don't see any reason why they shouldn't have to drive to Broadway. Yeah. Well, Amazon can deliver to them. Right, Amazon can But we don't like to. Amazon. <laughs> okay. Because well, no, but, it's killing all our retail but, stores, well, but anyway. But Amazon can deliver to them and others can deliver to them. You can't have the United States Postal Service delivering mm -hmm. marijuana. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say I'm with Jeanette um, for slightly different reasons, but I, I, I think this was very wisely designed in terms of being going small at the beginning. Small and safe, I would say. And I think to the extent that we, so we're, we're holding off on events we're holding off on cafes. I, I see this as falling into that same category of, you know, it, it increases the battles we're fighting about the, about the law. Okay. All right, so deliveries, no. I don't know what you're thinking. No, I agree. Okay. I used to deliver pharmaceuticals. Three, one, zero. Really? <laughs> 311, no delivery. I think we took care of it. I think everybody agreed on the gifting language. Yeah, I don't know why I had that on the list, but back when we initially talked about it, you said put it on the list, and then, I'm sorry, I don't remember why, but I didn't want to keep it on it. That's a different language. language. You didn't like, you didn't especially like the language that you oh, used. I didn't love the language. You didn't love the language, and you thought you might have a better language that you might love better. Right. Okay. That's I'll think about that. I'll just maybe shoot an email over to the AG's office and see if they got any thoughts and they want to comment. All right. On it. Well, so there are basically two huge issues left. One of them is the tax, which is really the government 
the, the finance committee. However, uh, looking at the board and how you structure the board with the plan the lot, which is government operations, is going to have recommendations, will depend a lot on the tax. And they can use the entire excise tax as general fund revenue or use some of it to uh, support the board action. So just keep that in mind because if the, the legislative council's estimates for the cost of the board, at least in the initial years, is higher than what I was anticipating. So I don't think you could recoup that through fees. So it might have to take some of the excise tax and use it for the board. So it depends on how you, I can't, I don't think we can discuss that this year, but I'm open to the idea that some of the tax revenue might have to go to the board functions, at least initially. Mm -hmm. And the term of the, has anybody, one thing we forgot in tax related is how we do revenue sharing with local government, if there is going to be any revenue sharing beyond the 1% local option tax in communities that have adopted. Should we do like Massachusetts and do some revenue share? I, I do think we should prohibit the, I, I just think it was the extortion, I don't know what they called it, but. Post community local agreements. Post agreements. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're recommending against those. Give us $50,000 or. Right. Yeah. We yeah, don't have any like We don't have, we don't have, have any have host <laughs> agreements. <laughs> right. Massachusetts, it's not in here. they put in host agreements. Just saying, I think we should prohibit it. Because you could have a local community that says we're going to prohibit it. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's fine. Um, also, just kind of a little bit related to that is um, I have language that uh, GovOps is going to review this afternoon around the issue of uh, your concern that a municipality didn't go around the opt out, but basically use their no other. Ex other inherent authority to basically make them ban them, and so right. we've got some language to take a Wodowski look at. could easily zone them out by saying not within a thousand feet of the school, playground, daycare, center, you know. Put them in the industrial zone. I mean, they could control that, so if you're saying They could, but I'm saying that Wodowski, being so small in the area, could effectively zone them by saying you can't be within a certain distance. So, uh, Remember when we discussed sex offenders? We, we, we have some recommended language around how to do that so that a community doesn't say, um, yes, we'll allow them and they can operate from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. You don't want them to be able to do that? Right. They, they can't effectively zone them, so eliminate them by ordinances or zoning. They have to have a, an actual opt-out vote if they want to eliminate them or prohibit them, I mean. And has that been the case on other things that they actually have a vote by the people and not by the governing, governing board? Liquor. Doesn't the governing, the governing board does liquor? They decide they, on but licenses. They, the, but they decide on the licenses, but if you want to become, if you want to be a dry community, it's the, 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 it has, it's the community the, vote. The, the local board yeah. on the liquor license, I actually had this experience when I was on the select board. We had a, a bar that was frequently Fights and other things were frequently occurring, and the, the police department were being called to this establishment on a frequent basis. Yeah. So you can threaten to withdraw their license based mm -hmm. upon yeah. they're not contacting their patrons. Is that right. the bar just around the corner from your shop? No, actually, that one wasn't. It was on Main Street. But, um, Large Johnson's? No. Um, <laughs> um, Parada. I'm not. I'm not Reggie Perron oh. at the bar right across the floor for Depot. Yes. A lot of funny stories about Reggie, but. Was he from Brattleboro? No, Brattle? from Bennington. Oh, but, but we have a, a whole family. I'm sure they're oh. all related, but yeah. Reggie was a, a long-term select board member who got oh. elected to the select board while he was in jail. Oh, it's like Matthew Matthews. Anyway, Reggie was a character, a great friend. Um, so, we good on this? On the host agreements? Yeah. For parody, for but what about revenue sharing? Oh, on revenue sharing. So, uh, <coughs> Thea had 
sent you some language a little while right. ago and has, but we hadn't heard back from you, so we weren't sure. She would be the person to talk to about the revenue sharing. Do you want to talk about that in here? I can text her, see if she can come down just a little bit after okay. we talk about the other issues. Would you like me yep. to do that? Yes, please. I had a brilliant idea. Will, will you email her and ask her if she can come down and talk about the, the revenue sharing? But she would also need to send you copies of the language after I tweet it. Like the clean language, I tweaked it. Uh, the revenue sharing, you said? Revenue sharing, revenue like on sharing. The com with the with communities? Revenue sharing and the documents. She should know the document, it should be. Yep. So she would send that document to you for copy yep. or copy room or whatever. Yep. So, when do you want to come down? Uh, she can come, uh, do you want to talk about the, the dispensaries now? And then, I don't, know what she, I don't know what her schedule is, so just see when she could come sometime okay. in the next Hour. She wants to know if you want to um, have her come down. If you want to talk about the other so things first and then have her come no, down. No, we covered most of the um, the question about moving the registry and dispensary sections of the medical, moving registry and dispensary sections to the medical cannabis bill. So taking them out of here. Taking them out of here. So the, the issue with that is because the sections that you have in S54 are inherently related to all the other sections in terms of moving the programs over to the board and the adoption of the new structure and stuff. Um, if they're moving independently, I mean, they kind of, it, it, they don't. But, but, the, but the idea of the, that the medical society was testifying against yesterday, or the day before, whenever that day was here, mm -hmm. I guess it was yesterday. Is there any problem moving those? The changes to the medical marijuana program. The statutory changes. Yeah. Uh, I understand. Right. Well, um, well the, the statutory changes that are all on there contemplate a, regula a, a regulated system under the board, not under under DPS. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then the board doesn't exist in the other in the medical bill. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they all kind of they all build on one another. So. Um, So, so right. So the so the se sections that they're talking about, okay, which they well, don't. Okay. Go to the section on the medical that we talked about yesterday. Um, just was talking about the requirement of the what I was specifically talking about was the requirement of the amount of time a relationship with the professional mm -hmm. And she was saying, you know, there should be three months. So where is that yeah. section? I think it's 35. So that is, starts on yeah, right. section yeah. 9, starts section on page 35. Nine, page 35. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Remember where that so all that I didn't mean to take out, but what I was wondering about, where is the the three month thing is um it's not in here anymore well it's not in here right, it's because. not in here anymore and she also objected to page 37 line four those two things right so that so the qualifying condition and then also having the three month right. um, uh, patient health care provider relationship so um uh you could you could um change those you can have those any way you want the initial reason for the change was that is that this this system for the registry? These would take effect after there is a legal market. Mm -hmm. So let's say um, let's say you know person A is a is a fifty year old woman. Um, she can walk into a retail licensed cannabis establishment and buy an ounce of cannabis or cannabis products under under the new system. Um, if she wanted to. Uh, uh, she had a 
qualifying condition. She wanted to go to a licensed dispensary because she wanted to, they had different products or whatever it is, she wanted to be on the registry. Um, the, I think the thinking originally with this bill was that an, it shouldn't be super hard for her to obtain products from a dispensary if she can buy essentially cannabis legally from any licensed retail store so um, so that there is a lessening of the requirements to become a patient on the registry. Um, but you can decide what those qualifications are what, however you want. Okay, take out C, put it in the new bill. C on page 37? Yep. Put that. My suggestion is you mean to just go back, C. go back to the original definition that yeah. you have in statute and that's now? Because that's going to be like, you, that's anything. You're, you're putting a big um, uh, bullseye right. on the bill for mm -hmm. Ann Pugh. If we leave this in here, I'd rather have the bullseye on the other bill. Okay, so just I'll just go back to the, I'll have to, it's, it's more than just, you know, I'll just tweak it. So I'll go back to existing language for the call for the uh, it's not right now, it's debilitating medical condition. I'll, I'll have to go back and I'll just change it and I'll make it yeah, but, off. but take yeah. out C. Yep. That's, yeah. that's all yeah. you're doing. Yeah. I, I leave the rest of it in and they can, we can argue about that with the House later on. But what I'm saying is just take out C or do you want me to go back to the same? No, 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 no. Just take, just out, take C out C. So okay. that an other disease condition or We've okay. been fighting this for yep. 10 years with. with Representative Pugh and the Health the Human Services Committee. So that fight should take place in the other medical marijuana bill, not in this bill. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that one. I have a bit of the same concern about the three month, and I understand that. The, um, how it will be so much easier to do it, but I, I think the value of having a relationship with your primary care physician and then having a, um, so that your primary care physician knows what your issues are and then they say, I, I think that it would be good for you um, to, to, I mean, I think it would, I'm certifying that you should be able to go on that. Medical marijuana if, have, so, if you I, go to line 15 on page 36, and you have cancer, multiple sclerosis, positive status, age, blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, I don't know how long you need to know. I mean, three months, you could be dead. Right, right. It's changed in three months. Well, we, 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 don't, we did we put did, qualifying did, but it's not in there. In there. Okay, is it totally gone now? It's totally yeah. gone. So you don't have what to get she any... was arguing that we need, she wanted to put the three months back in. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I mean, we did make provisions. I, I would argue you go to the emergent care, they send you the emergency room, and you find out you're, you, know, you have cancer, and you, have, you may not have more than three months to live. That's you already. Wait three months. You don't have to under that what we passed before. That's been taken out. There are a number of reasons you don't have to have a three-month relationship, okay. but Good. Thank you've you already taken that. that out. Thank you for doing that. So th this would mean you don't have to have a relationship, just you have a one-shot visit. Right. right. Well, because, as Michelle yeah. explained, you don't need a relationship to go into the store and buy it. The only right. advantage right. would be yeah. then that you, you don't have to pay a tax if you're yeah. a medical right. patient. And you hopefully get more than just a product going right, to a dispenser. You get health care yeah. advice. And, I mean, that's the that's value, value of, of a dispenser. Oh, all right. to, but anyway. Next I'm, controversy, I'm gonna, and I don't know that we'll settle it today. It sounded very beguiling. Allowing dispensaries to sell early which means allowing them to set up shop before the regulated market would be able to take place. Yep. Uh, I said yesterday I oppose that. Um, I think the dispensary should get a license in advance of other people <coughs> because they've, they've been doing a service to the state. But I think if we allow them 
advantage in the license and allow them to call it a year's head start on everybody else, I think we're falling afoul of all the things that the equity advocates were talking about all along, which is find ways to start everybody evenly, including making up for handicaps that people were given during the war on drugs, among other things. So when I asked were there any minority-owned uh, dispensaries, I think possibly two one is owned by uh, by women. Two. 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 Are owned by women. Okay, but but I would imagine 100% um, white ownership I would, would be my guess. So yes. so if we if we start them a year ahead, we're in effect building into the system an advantage that that may be overcome at some point, but may not. So I I don't. Personally, I don't see why they need to start in advance of anybody else. The, the main argument is that they would like the money, but everybody would like the money. I, so I don't think that they want the money. I think it would be generating money for the state to put into the infrastructure. No, but, it, but I'm saying yes. anybody would be happy to be the first to go, and they would all give the state the money. I think those would be more orderly. Perhaps be more respected by I don't have any real serious dog in that argument. I can understand why if they're set up and running right now, they technically have an advantage that can lead the way, but valid arguments around the table as to why that shouldn't be the case because they're giving a jump start on everybody else. Well, I think they should be able to go first as long as you set it up so that they're not in a monopoly position once the whole thing starts, because I do think we're going to need money to operate this sooner rather than later, and particularly when you start to look at various issues and appropriations later on as the bill moves through. So I would think that we'd want to consider some way, but I'd also like to consider some way for them to um, purchase product, not only from their own grow operations, but <coughs> people who could get early licenses as well, which would allow at least some small cultivation earlier on. Then. So I think you could structure it so that you could have while, you know, Corporation X would not be able to sell early because they're not, they don't have a medical <coughs> place, but Corporation Y could, that wants to cultivate, could develop a relationship as long as the testing is available with the medical dispensary groups and sell their product to them on a wholesale basis, and that way they could have the grow starting earlier than other might otherwise be available. I think you can have, I don't think it needs to necessarily, because people are already in the business, they're already getting hurt by the underground market that we created for the, um, for the legalization last year. Mm -hmm. um, and we know their sales are down by 20% or so around the state. I, I don't know if that's an accurate number of change. I've heard that. <laughs> this would be a way for them to recruit some of that loss at the same time providing revenue to the state early on. You look at Massachusetts, they opened, they've only opened four places in two years. And they're all in rural areas. So, you know, the biggest problem, I if I took it, you know, and put words in the mouth of the great Barrington Select Board member, his biggest problem was parking because of all the people that lined up to get into his shop, or not his shop, but the shop in Great Barrington. So one's open in Great Barrington, North, uh, Northampton, I think. Uh, a couple in the, in the, in the uh, Boston suburbs, but nothing, nothing's open in Boston, nothing's open in a lot of those places. According to the Globe story, the black market is thriving Massachusetts at 75% right now. So, 
That's my my reason for saying we should set up a system that could allow them to start early, um, but also require them to buy some product from others. So I, I there is no way those four dispensaries could ever have a monopoly. They're they're not big enough to to supply the need. I mean, they're just they're just not. So <clears throat> they are already set up, like Alice said. So we, we could, I don't know if it's possible or not, but we have a section in here on page 21 that says the board shall consider special, the special needs of people, uh, cultivators under 500 square feet. And maybe that's where you put the ability of those small cultivators to um, have the, clearly the rules will be a little bit different for them and we're just saying that they should to allow them to begin to sell to the dispensaries earlier which is what Senator Sears just suggested that so you have really small cultivators the other um, I have a, another issue around kind of ownership but that I'll bring that up later but I think you could instruct the board to develop some rules that allow them to to do that, and they'll never have a monopoly. No. And and uh, so I I I counted out as three two or three three one maybe. Um, so I I will put it this way: my concern is about structural inequities that we're building in from the start. So I think if we're going to go with early rollout for the dispensaries we could think about balancing that with, we've yet to talk about the composition of the board itself, and the advocates for equity have wanted to have one of those five people. We've got that in, we're, recommend, okay. we're making recommendations yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, I think that would be a way of, of balancing. But yeah, we, that is uh, there. the list down here of the government operations yep. committee, we don't have their report yet because they're <laughs> slacking. We, we've been slacking. <laughs> you know, that's the nature of our committee. We've been at it for four years. What's taking us so long? Yeah, well, we have some members who haven't been at it for four years and who like to talk about it. Michelle? So actually, um, I have, you guys have language from me on an early rollout. If you want to take a look at it, I can just walk you through and you can give you a sense for some of the issues and you can tell me the concepts that you like and the concepts that you don't like. Um, it, it's it, just a few pages. You didn't have a folder. Temporary so license for early sales. Temporary license for early sales. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Um, so uh, this does not contemplate, but it certainly can, this, this does not contemplate having uh, small mm -hmm. cultivators under a new license sell mm -hmm. to dispensaries, but we can, we can figure that out. The, the sticking point with that that I just have to figure out is under what types of rules and, and regulations yeah. because you, you know it just takes a little time to do that but the, let me just walk you through this if that's okay and then i'll just explain to you the concepts and um you can give me an indication if it's something you like or you want to go in a different direction um so generally what it what it would do is that if for the existing uh registered medical dispensaries if they chose to um, that they would be able to sell cannabis and cannabis products on a limited basis to the public prior to implementation of the new licensing system. So while the new licensing system, while new rules are being adopted, all stuff, they would operate under their existing system and under this section. Um, it would be, they would basically obtain temporary licenses from the Department of Public Safety who regulates them now those licenses would expire basically once the uh, the commercial retail is up and running. So it would be a temporary license um, to be selling to the to the public, um, and they'd be required to to ensure that they could be still meeting the needs of their patients and caregivers that they serve as well at the same time. Um, so you'll see that's kind of language in subsection B, subsection C. Um, is basically notwithstanding the limitations under their existing statutory guidance around, you know, you can only sell to these people such and such. Um, so it would allow them to do it. You'll see on the second page, subsection D, so from August 1st to October 1st of this year, a dispensary could submit a, a, a letter to the Department of Public Safety 
um, uh, requesting to obtain the temporary license. Uh, they have to submit a detailed explanation of how they plan to implement the program for sales to the public while maintaining their obligations to patients and caregivers. And then the department works with the dispensary applicant on meeting the criteria and compliance with existing Chapter 86 and rules adopted that would be relevant to this new duty. So um, then the department would issue a temporary license no more than 60 days after the letter of intent is received by the department and sales to the public could begin January 1st of next year. And then all those temporary licenses would expire July 1st of 2021 and that's when you you know you could have the first retail sales in april of that year so hopefully you would have other stores up and running and then if a dispensary wanted to then continue selling to the public they would have to be going through the same process as everybody else to obtain a retail license in addition to their dispensary license mm -hmm. um, you'll see subdivision d2 so it's for the uh the opportunity to have that temporary license uh, would be a one-time fee of $75,000 um, so for each dispensary um, the fee would be going into the cannabis regulation fund the way that you have s54 set up is that that fund is all the fees from everything that funds basically the board and the regulatory structure because you have the taxes going to the general fund and so this kind of fills the hole that you have right now, which is that you don't have fees coming in until the second fiscal year. And so there's no fees coming into that fund the first year of the board's operation. So you'd have to do a straight up appropriation. So theoretically, all four. There's five. Or there's five. five. There's five. 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 There's five. So all five if they want to participate thousand plus yep plus what also you would have is that once they start sales you would have the tax revenue coming in you could decide if you wanted to and, and, and on that on that first year or two until you have the retail sales maybe you want to divert some of that tax money into the fund again to support creating the structure so everybody else can participate um, so, uh, so that's the, 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 the funding language on D2. Um, you'll see starting at the bottom of the second page, subsection E, the things that they could do, they could cultivate, package, legal, transport, test cannabis, um, uh, use cannabis and cannabis products to produce products, and package and label and test the products, and sell the cannabis and cannabis products to the public for consumption off the registered premises. Um, definition of public, just back on page one, means persons 21 years of age or older who are not patients or caregivers on the registry. So what, what does transport mean? We don't have definitions currently, I don't think, in Chapter 86 for transport. Um, it's not, uh, uh, it's not, I would not consider it to be delivery, but if that's something you wanted to look at and define, you can do that. Is um, it tr transporting from their grow facility to their retail facility? I would envision that's one possibility, but I don't know what the rest of the word might mean. Yeah, that. I don't think we define transport under the current law, but we could. Um, so you see, subsection F is exempting them from the current. Uh, Cultivation plant limits right now dispensaries um, right, If you're a patient you have to designate which dispensary you're going to go to you can't just go to any dispensary So a dispensary's plant limits are uh, tagged uh, to how many let's, dispensaries let's look at that when you add in the other language about buying from others because I oh, uh, maybe, right. sure. That may be in, in conflict with mm -hmm. the goal here to allow small bowl cultivators to start the Okay um, subsection G, I just put that in there in the context of contemplating, so how do you, you know, you want to make sure that the, by selling to the public, they aren't then negatively impacting patients who are, who are currently being served by the program. And something that we've definitely heard from some other jurisdictions is sometimes there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a supply, a lack of supply actually to meet demands. And if okay, you could, so, the, so the I just patients, put in different days. Are entitled to make appointments on those days to avoid significant. So the patients could come in and jump ahead of the line. Sure. Okay. 
but yeah. the dispense, so maybe that should be a separate section because you, you're talking, I, I was confused by it when I first read it. So the dispensary may sell to the public only on Thursday, right. Friday, and then a new eight would be patients of the dispensary shall be entitled to make appointments on those days to avoid it. Right, okay. Yeah, because so it's clear right that now, there's a difference between a member of the public and a, member, and a patient of that dispensary. Right, so right now, and I don't, you know, I'm sure the dispensaries have different days of operation and things like that, but the idea was being that because currently patients are required to make an appointment with the dispensary, they can't just show up, that's not changing, they would, that would still happen. I understand. Okay. I just, um, the dispensary, I don't know if Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays, I don't know. If you I just think that because Quebec is doing it that way, but you can okay. pick any well, days you want. I don't care what they <laughs> I'm wondering if I'm back on D1. It's in the middle of that section, it says, so they, they submit a detailed explanation, then the department shall work with the dispensary applicant on meeting this criteria and compliance with the provisions in 18 BSA chapter 86 and rules adopted pursuant to the chapter. Mm -hmm. Does that refer to rules that are already adopted or yes. that they will? Adopt? No, that are already adopted because the, the, the issue here is, is, is trying to figure out how can you, because <coughs> getting a new system takes time and right. you can only shave so much time off of that, how can you use the existing system and the existing people who are currently regulated and operating under that system to, to do some sales in order to start funding implementation of the new system? Yeah, I mean, the committee will work its will. I, I just feel like we're, we're adding a level of, in, in order to get it going really fast, we're adding this level of, so we're going to have these guys rolling out on a different timeline with different kind of makeshift rules for the rec market, even as we're going through a deliberate process to create rules for the other market. And I guess I just don't, I don't see the necessity for that, other than uh, I understand for the owners of the dispensaries, it, it will make a lot of sense. But just as how you put together and roll out public policy, it just seems, you know, we've got the board developing rules with theoretically the public process involved with that. And then we've got these going forward under a different system. I don't know, it just doesn't, uh, seems to get elevated to me. But if, if, the, if the idea is really to get it going quickly, I see why this makes sense because it's the only way to do it. Thank you. Um, do you want me just to the, finish the, the end ones? And so on, on subsection H, um, single transaction would be a half an ounce of cannabis or equivalent in cannabis products. Is that what we decided? No, this is this is um, less than what you have in S54 in the retail. Um, you could make this anything you want, but again, thinking around supply issues. Well, what, what, what are we doing in the big bill? I don't care about an ounce. supply. Huh? An ounce. An ounce. I would just start with an ounce. Here. You're welcome to. This is this is somebody else's that I drafted for them, and they told me it was okay to share with y'all. So. <laughs> well, I think we should. I I don't know why we would limit. That's what you can have legally now, right? Is an ounce. Yeah. Okay. How are they going to pay for it? I'm sorry, who's uh, who's going to pay? Senator White walks into the store in Brattleboro to make a purchase. How is she going to pay for it? Cash? Okay. Credit card? My smile. Check. <laughs> I think I would direct that to, to, the, to the dispensaries and how they're doing it now. My understanding is it's, it's not too fast, but I think they are accepting some debit or credit cards now, but you would have to talk to them about how they do that now. Not necessarily credit cards, uh, debit cards for sure, and then there are some credit cards that are setting up a system basically. Uh, you know, if you have a smartphone, you can get certain credit on the application and then you can use that to pay. So I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. All right, but just curious. Um, so I'd like to, in the plus is an objection, I'd like to allow it up to an ounce. That's what we were doing. 
So H2 is that cannabis and cannabis products sold to patients and caregivers shall be priced at least 10% below the same products that might be sold in, to the public? They, they already oh, pay no yeah. tax, right? Yeah. Right. So now we, it's giving them a double. I'm fine. I'm fine because it's you're talking about a, a remedy here as opposed to a. Well, would we do that with other drugs? Well, it seems designed well, to keep the. I want to walk into the to the pharmacy to buy my prescription. Do I get a ten percent discount? From what? Maybe. But 10% below what? This is 10% below the same product that's available to the public. You, there isn't a, an equivalent with a farm track. Does that mean they jacked up the price? No, I'm saying that you, if you walk in with a prescription. I'm just wondering why we're getting involved in the price. This, yeah. this is a really I, I don't care temporary that. arrangement right. for. Yeah, this is just for the 18 oh, month oh, period. Yeah. Oh, okay. so why are we getting why involved in the price? You don't have to. Well, it seems like, it, I, I mean, I won't guess who the requester of the drafting was, but the only way it would make sense is if it's to give a competitive advantage to the dispensaries in the direct market. But, but, no, we should know that it's only a temporary no, arrangement yeah. before the sales take place in the regular market. Right, but so what I was going to be in here. But for these 18 months, there's an advantage to being a patient because you get right. no tax and you get a 10% discount. What am I missing? We're still I, not selling it to the public yet, so we don't know what the public sells. No, we're selling it to the public. Uh, we're selling it to this 18 no. month time period? Yeah. yeah. That's what this is. The dispensaries would be open to okay. okay. public. Never mind. Yeah, I got you. Never mind. Uh, not restaurant, store. I think the, the idea was that I think the sponsor folks were concerned they, they didn't want people to be thinking that by allowing dispensaries to sell to the public during this interim period that it would negatively <coughs> impact those folks who were currently receiving goods and services. On what the hell business is it about? I, just, I have a hard time with that, with this whole concept that we're going to determine whether or not. So if I'm the dispensary owner, I'm just going to jack the price up by 10% to the retail, and then I'm selling it at what I was going to sell it at anyway. I don't see why we're involved in pricing. If we're going to get involved in pricing, then we should say they have to sell it 10% below the black market price on weed.com. <laughs> now, I'm serious. So would we do that? Would we require them to sell a 10% below weed.com's report for the week? I've never been to weed.com, by the way. I've heard you go there and get the price. I didn't know it existed. That's, no, that's what, uh, I'm, I'm not making this up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go Joint there. Fiscal went to weed.com <laughs> to figure out the amount that of revenue that we would get. By, by the price on weed.com. Okay, let's take that out. So I would I, know I don't if we care. paid 10% below the average retail price on weed.com for that area. Yeah, that's the number. Yeah, that's what they said. 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 Yeah, because he, that's what he did. He went on a website. Wait, yeah, that was a few years ago. Yeah. You remember? Yep, I do. Okay, so I, I you verify that he set the revenue based upon the website. They were yes, it was it was widely it was it was wildly varying depending. Right. It was work, It was basically one of those things where consumers just add information and say, oh, I bought weed here for an ounce, or oh, I got a half an ounce for this. So I don't know how scientific. All right, so we're taking this out. I, well, I'll do whatever you guys want. Remember, like, this isn't mine. I'm just the messenger, so you can get mad at me. <laughs> really? <laughs> 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 I'm 
Pull up some language and print that out, but I cannot promise you an intelligent discussion of tax well, from I'm me. Well, I'm going to take that chance because um, we only have a, we have a half an hour. It's too valuable to waste. Sure. Because somebody's not available. Um, yep. So let me find. So you can pull that up. Mm -hmm. It says meme.com, coming soon. Yeah, that's what that's, that's, that's all, But that's all it says. It's I'm coming soon. Imagine that the owner of that name right now is holding it out to the highest bidder. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and there's a picture of a very still looking guy. <laughs> Why you would do that? Let's see. Oh, wait, okay. I'm looking at what does we cost. Oh, jeez. I mean, I wouldn't have put that picture up, but. I've been welcome to watch that. Yeah. It's kind, kind of dark and foreboding. Yeah. yeah. How do I get rid of this? Yeah, I never did that before. Okay, high quality. I don't think you. According to the. That's your history. Yeah, I don't want According that. to, excuse me, priceofweed.com. Oh, price, price of weed. Price of weed. Price of weed. Price of weed. Uh, okay. Average wheat in the United States, high quality, two hundred and thirty-two dollars and ninety-seven cents per ounce. Medium quality, one hundred and ninety-six point eighty-eight per ounce. Low quality, I feel bad for these guys. <laughs> and where, reading what's where, 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 where is that price from? Washington it's Weed Prices, priceofweed.com. This is what they don't want. Okay. monopolies and big corporations from coming here mm -hmm. and the suggestion was that we um, say that they they need to and I don't even begin to understand what this means really but that uh, we should prohibit complex corporate structures and allow only closely held or individual corporations and I, I um, we are suggesting that one of the people that uh, is on the board have some uh, knowledge of corporate structures and how and finance and all that kind of stuff, but I, I don't know if we want to send any direction to the board about when they're granting permits. The, the, I don't even remember who this came from, but that um, it would help maintain that the small and Vermont based as opposed to the um, Anheuser Bushes. I don't know where it came from, but that was. Um, a suggestion that came? I wrote right. it down. I wanted to put it into the legislative intent. Into? I think you should put it in. But I was thinking of putting it in the priorities. I think we should probably yeah, ask. Otherwise, we just bug away. We don't have any legislative intent here, so I guess right. I wouldn't put it in there. No, I put it in the priorities. <coughs> well, maybe, yeah, they yeah. could go into the priorities, I guess. But somehow it would be. Um, and, and I don't, I, I admit that I don't know the language that would go there, but something to 
so that you didn't have multinational corporations um, getting up all the time. Can you say that really quick? Can I say that really quick? I can't even say it slowly. I can't even say it slowly. <laughs> so anyway, that was just a... Was it Paul? One could make a campaign on that job. <laughs> I don't remember who said it. I oh, it's the white-haired guy who's a U.S. senator frequently discussing running for president. Uses that term very frequently. Does he? Oh, well, then I take I take it back. <laughs> no. Sorry. Sorry. He's a former mayor of Burlington. I know who you mean now. I don't, I, if he'd said it, I probably wouldn't have paid attention. Peter Clavel. Peter Clavel frequently yeah. says multi-tenant. <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to Before we get it? Sure. Well, she's coming right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Um, Can you grab yeah. it? So David Hilton's printing stuff off in the coffee room. I just printed what I could for the committee room right. and office. So oh, there's okay. more for other people. The idea okay. is how you and I'll post set up a revenue sharing well, with the community. For sure. I want to, I, I so know, this is like our markup. Okay. Communities okay. could use okay. the money okay. to do certain things that are related. Could you pass that to me? Oh, I'm sorry. Right, we've got an extra one. Somebody. And, and are these only the communities that have establishments? Or yes. Is this everything? Right. Yeah. If you have an establishment, you would get a certain amount of the revenue that's generated in your, in your community, and you could use that revenue in a manner that is beneficial to something related to marijuana. You could use it for your schools to prevention, you could use it for traffic safety, you could use it for more parking at the establishment, you could use it whatever, it, but it has to be related to the fact that you have this marijuana. Is so this it's an, an impact, to it's called a community, a cannabis community impact account. Is this in addition to the 1% yes. options yes. tax yep. that they could use? Yep. So they could have a 1% options tax and then we're going to send the money from the state to the towns that have an establishment, as opposed to the neighboring town that's getting all the overflow and the crap. Right. Well, that, maybe the na neighboring town would want to then establish their own establishment, and then they could have a community impact. I, I'm, I, I, I have to read this and see how this. If you look at page nine, that goes into explaining. Because we currently have um, towns can can assess a community well, before impact. Before you say no, can okay, you no, look at it? I'm just saying the towns currently can assess a community impact, uh, impact statement on a development. Well, that but the problem is there. Then you're running into the host agreement problem. No, 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 do you want me just to show you, just real quick, yeah. summarize what's in yeah. here, and then you guys can discuss okay. a little bit? I, so I, I would start, actually, if you look at page 9, um, if you look at page 9, and you look at uh, the new subchapter, and the, the yellow is just Anthea did, and then I edited her edits over blue, so just it, it's all, anything that's colored is, is new language. So there's a community uh, imp uh, impact fee equal to 3% of the gross sales of each cultivator and retailer license pursuant to uh, the new law. Um, so for, with regard to gross sales. Um, then you have on page 10, just the process. So for on or before the 15th day of the fiscal quarter, um, they, uh, cultivators and retailers submit uh, to the Department of Taxes, a statement containing the name, place of business, total amount of gross sales, subject to the community impact fee, um, a requirement for records in subsection C. Um, it's going to be, uh, the fees are going to be imposed under the authority and collected by the Department of Taxes. Um, it's going to be deposited into Cannabis Community Impact Account that is within the Cannabis Regulation Fund on a, on a quarterly basis. So that like goes back to like on the first page where you have the amendments to the Regulation Fund is that 
you have kind of this sub account within the regulation fund that is used to fund the pro the implementation in the program. So if you look at page 11, the board is to adopt rules to implement uh, and administer the community impact fee account and the application for and distribution of revenues in the account. Um, and then there's the, the uh, things that, that the rules are supposed to address. So procedures for municipalities with either a cultivator or a retailer within their boundaries to apply to the board for revenue from the account to cover costs reasonably related to the costs imposed upon the municipality by the operation of the cultivator or retailer. Criteria for the board to consider when distributing revenues from the account to the municipalities. Accounting and record keeping procedures and procedures for what should happen with revenues in the account at the end of the fiscal year. So the board will be doing the rulemaking to basically say this is how this is the process. You collect it, it all goes into the sub account, and then and then municipalities can apply for monies from that account. So this is my idea. I'll take the whole response. Okay. So the the cannabis local option tax seems to me like a very simple way to do this. Yep. In other words, you have an establishment. You, you use the option tax to recover your your costs. Well, actually, it's used for anything. Well, that's what I mean. But but having an additional grant program, because if they're if they're submitting costs, you have to have a bureaucracy to vet these, to decide if they're reasonably related, and then to issue money. So I I think the local cannabis option already does this without any of that. Machinery, I guess. Does this increase the likelihood of federal intervention? Tell me your thinking behind that, and I hadn't thought I hadn't thought of that. But tell me why. The feds seem to take real objection to the idea that the state is collecting money from this program. I don't know, I just haven't played it out in my head, but there was a real rabid federal prosecutor who wanted to take a stab. The likelihood of them going after a local option tax is, I think, pretty low. Going after something that the state is actually constructing a mechanical apparatus to collect money and redistribute. I'm just wondering if that's kind of based on Massachusetts. Well, I don't I'm just trying to play out all odds. Well, I'm uh, uh, taking Phil's comment. And, uh, yes. So we, we didn't talk about this particularly, but this sounds to me a lot like a host community agreement. I mean, they're paying 3%. And communities already have the ability to, imp to levy impact fees on any kind of a development that happens in their town through their zoning bylaws and ordinances. So if, if a, an establishment came into town that, that was going to impact the municipal sewer or the fire department or the school in some way, they could assess an impact fee on them related to those increased costs, but not just because they had the establishment there. Because just because they have an establishment does not mean they're going to have additional costs. It it doesn't. Um, and but if they could if they could show that it had an additional impact on the community, they could assess those impact fees well, right now. Well, let me offer a Go to two percent on the uh, local option tax. Drop this. I feel better about that. Sorry. The, People wasted so much paper on it. I didn't expect this response. Yeah. I, I well, it would be more, I'm trying to look at yeah. incentives to communities to host these establishments mm -hmm. rather than 2% would be a good amount of money. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be, you mean 1% on top of the. Yeah. It's in the bill. One percent's in the bill now. Two percent would be doubling that. Not the excise tax. We leave the extra ten percent excise tax as it is for the 
planning mm -hmm. committee to figure out, and obviously the option tax too, but it, as it leaves here, it would contain a 2% instead of 1% local option tax. Yeah. Um, I, I think we need to stop calling it an option tax, by the way. It would be a local tax of 2% would be imposed on the just have it. Yeah. I don't know why a community would not want it. Aren't there some that just philosophically don't do local option taxes? Right. Right. Well, they don't have to do a local option tax to have a cannabis local option tax. Well, they well what I mean is, right. I yeah, they choose not to do it because it, it's a burden on their yeah. businesses. Yeah. yeah. And so people go to the next town to buy. Yeah, the but same this should be just this business. Yeah. This should be one industry. Yeah. Yeah. Which is different because yeah. you right. have. Are you saying that it shouldn't be an option? That it should, so instead of any municipality may collect a local option, a municipality may. shall? No, may. Uh, I don't think right, we should tell them that they have to. Yeah. But how do they, yeah. how do they determine whether they're going to may do it? They have a vote. Yeah. Yeah. The way they do it now, they have a vote. Local yeah, but they have, right now they have to go through a charter change in order to do it under the... Mm -hmm under the current established No, I think what, well, this is, what this is doing is, is kind of establishing yeah, so they can just have it at, at a town meeting. Um, they can decide whether they want to impose the 2% tax and then it's automatic, or do they have to go through some kind of a... They, they, we can put it in, Michelle, we can put it in that section of the, uh, the um, options that municipalities the, the authority we give them. We've put a couple other things in there under the authority that we give towns to do things because we're a Dillon state. So we can put that in there, that they have the right to impose a 2%, up to a 2% options tax. Um, I, think, I think you're already covered here, but I'll, I'll double okay. back just to check. Make just sure check that they don't have to yeah. come back to yeah. the legislature. No, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. They would, no I think we've already, no. we've yeah. already contemplated that. Yeah. I think took care of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll double check though. Right. But you would like to go to two, so I'm I'm uh, presuming we're doing a strike all judiciary amendment and you would like a two percent to, to change the local change one to option two. to yes. two. Okay. Rather than this convoluted system that I developed with your help. <laughs> <laughs> I kinda sounded like I knew what I was talking about, didn't I? You did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> What's your name? Anthea. And yeah. is that your helper? Uh, no, she <laughs> is a new attorney on our staff, and she is doing uh, transportation and some money issues. She did a terrific job, and thank her very much. But we reject, but the committee rejected. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, but we, we didn't reject her writing of it. No, no. So um, next Wednesday. Um, we're going to start at 8.30, so people, Peggy will remind you on Tuesday. Uh, that's to accommodate Senator Ash's schedule, because I want the Ash plan. The Ash The Ash challenge. <laughs> the Ash challenge. What's that going to be? Ash, A-S-H-E, <laughs> pro tem, challenge to the committee to reduce the prison population by 250, by 2022. So. I wanted him to present his challenge and then the committee can talk about it a little bit. But uh, those of you who want to be buckets, remember the, the challenge? You know, yeah, yeah. More uh, the so if you want to bring one for the time to <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so we need to start at 8.30. And then, Peggy, we're taking up this bill again on Friday next week mm -hmm. for a final vote. And if you can get a draft out to different people um, and us ahead of that on a Friday guys, show, people can go over it. Right. Could you uh, schedule a little time uh, earlier if you want to vote on Friday, a little yeah. time earlier yeah, that I can walk you that. through it in the week? And that way, if you want more changes, so you can be ready to go for a Do we have time on Wednesday or Tuesday? I don't. I'm pretty busy. All right. Depends on S37 how long time to take on that. Oh, people don't like it, so they want to talk, talk, talk. Um, Medical monitoring. I think Wednesday, depending on how long it took on the Ash Challenge. Thursday, I think it looks really busy. 
Mm -hmm. What's the oh, that's Thursday the, is the racial bias. Yeah. All right, we'll put it in Wednesday at 11. Wednesday at 11. Okay. And I will send it out to everybody beforehand, but I just don't want you to come in on Friday and then if there's things you still want changed and it will take some time, I, I, want, I just want to make sure we can meet your schedule. All right, Wednesday at 11 and then Friday for a final vote. Can I ask a procedural question? Yep. Do you want, um, we're going to walk through the, the suggestions that we're making. Do you want them to come in here first, or do you want Michelle to put them into the draft, and then we talk about them when we talk about the draft? I think the easier way would be to have the, um, have us know what the, what the government operation okay. committee would have. Okay, we can do that on Wednesday. We can do that on Wednesday, okay. Well, I don't want to, if we get bogged down completely on your proposal. No, it's very simple, they're very simple. Okay. And, and, and I think they're going to be finalizing theirs today, and so what I will do is make the tweaks that they decide on today. I can email them to all of you, and you can have a chance to look at them and have some conversations right. before uh, then. Do we, do um, we have time tomorrow to them? Right, I can come in tomorrow morning on, on GovOps amendments. Okay. If uh, that we're works. picking up Woodside, and then we're doing S18. Well, S18 what is this? Well, what, yeah. what, what is it? What is it? I guess that's the uh, unconscionable term. Oh. Yeah, <coughs> it's just because people don't like them. I mean, like unconscionable terms. That's why we have so many witnesses. Um, all right, we won't have time tomorrow, but if you can email them, and if we get in, uh, what, what are we starting with Woodside? All the time. Uh, we have Leslie Wisdom, Tom Shea, Judith Christian, Sam, and Jim Henry. Yeah, they won't take that. Lined up with time. Just call me. I, I, I think. Nine thirty on uh, tomorrow. Nine thirty. Nine forty-five to ten. Do you want to do okay. S fifty-four? The government yeah. operations recommendations on S fifty-four. Okay. Right. So, um, it shouldn't take more than fifteen twenty minutes. Right. Are hey, you sending me a meeting notice? Yeah. 9.45. And then you still want to take it up also uh, at 11 o'clock next Wednesday. So yes, 11 o'clock next Wednesday and then Friday final vote. <laughs> All right. Have a good day.